This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 92. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, the strategy, people, process, and technology sides of change. Uh, with me, as always, is Kyler. Kyler, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me today. Yeah, thanks for being here. We've got a great show, a lot to cover. Uh, we've got some uh, hot topics, which I'm going to go over here in just a second. But uh, later in the show, we're actually, I'm going to start with what we're covering later in the show uh, because it's really interesting. We're going to have a conversation about the uh, top ERP systems in the marketplace for 2023 that you should be considering. And we're going to talk about the um, top ERP systems in the context of the systems that we most commonly shortlist and recommend to our clients. So we're going to have uh, Adam Cheatham on the show, who's our managing director here based in the US. Uh, he works with our global teams on software selections throughout the world. So he's going to talk with me about uh, the top ERP systems that organizations should be considering in 2023 and beyond. Later in the show, we'll have uh, Donia and Nate from Third Stage Consulting. Uh, Nate's from Third Stage Consulting US. Donia's from Third Stage Consulting Africa. They recently did a Stratosphere presentation on change management deliverables. So we're going to talk about change management deliverables and what it, exactly it should be that comes out of your change initiatives. Uh, but before we get to that, though, our hot topics are really interesting, too. Uh, that's the first segment. We're going to cover the evolution of the flying car, which... Uh, we're going to go full Marty McFly back to the future, I suppose, on that one. Um, and those of you that, that aren't old enough to remember, which I know, Kyla, you, you probably never, have you ever even heard of Back to the Future? Oh, well, of course I, mean, I have. How oh, old okay. do you think I am? My God. Uh, you don't want me to. It's a, it's a core <laughs> American value, Back to the Future. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, so. I just never know, you know, with, I guess my kids have seen Back to the Future too. They, they aren't huge fans like I was, but they, they did see it and they liked it. Uh, so we'll talk about the evolution of the flying car. We'll talk about the auto industry's supply chain management comeback, which will be super interesting because a lot of people throughout the world are struggling with getting new cars or used cars, getting all those chips and missing components in their cars. Uh, we'll talk about the supply chain industry in automotive. And then we've got a couple of segments or a couple of topics we'll cover related to artificial intelligence. We'll talk about how AI is saving the whales. So in the spirit of AI being bigger than just uh, you know a technology, it's something that can do good for the world. We'll, we'll talk about how it's saving the whales. And I don't know if it's doing good for the world or not, but we're also going to talk about AI versus Taylor Swift. I suppose it depends on your musical preferences. I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan, but I appreciate uh, her as a mainstream entertainer. So we're going to talk about AI versus Taylor Swift. So let's dive into those hot topics first, and then we'll get to our, our guests later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's start with the whales. We'll start with a feel-good story. Okay, so um, we know AI has done a lot in specifically sustainability technology. It's kind of a, an additional lens and case study from what we talked about last week as far as the marketplace moving towards um, sustainable tech initiatives. So I wanted to profile an, a specific example of how a nonprofit has done that. So there's a project, it's called um, Whale Safe Project. And basically their mission is to use best-in-class technology with best-in-class conservative strategies, or I'm sorry, conservation strategies to create a unique solution to reduce the risk of whales. And I don't, maybe there's some whale specialists out there, but I had no idea that um, that whales in colliding with boats actually kill more than 20 20,000 whales every year, which was pretty significant. Hmm. Um, and then they also play a pretty significant um, role in capturing carbon from the atmosphere. So a single great whale um, can sequester about 33 tons of carbon dioc dioxide on average. So they actually play a lot of roles into actually um, sustaining the, the carbon initiatives in the environment too. So if you want to, you know, 
get on board with that. Just get yourself a whale. No, I'm just totally right. kidding. I don't <laughs> think you can buy whales before the blackfish people come after me. But um, I think that's frowned upon in today's right, day and right. Age. <laughs> it is. It is. Just support the whales through AI. Um, right. So in late September, this whale safe project, they deployed buoys that were eclipsed uh, equipped with onboard computers that record sounds using underwater microphones. So they could see if a particular species it was in danger of colliding with a boat or they were caught in a fishing web, which is actually pretty common as well. And they used the data, water conditioning, water conditions, and then the records of whale sightings to target the whale's location, then communicate and reroute automatically ships. So the computer then showcases that they need to move or go in a different direction with that. So that's a, an example of kind of what we talked about last week of utilizing that artif artificial intelligence. What my mind went to um, in you know the project manager side was just the overall compliance of, of how you would rewrite ships through an automated system. And that's what I kind of wanted to ask you about. Should there be some regulation around that? Or what's the human component of using an artificial intelligence in the maritime industry to reroute, say, freights? And what does that look like as far as a trickle-down impact on supply chains? I think there's a lot of upside potential to that, um, given that freight and shipping is, is such a problem in the supply chains today and there's not as much margin of error as there once was with with the bottlenecks throughout the supply chain so i think there's a lot of upside potential that's that's more the impact i see um you know not just with the shipping and avoiding killing whales but also just uh but also just making sure that you're optimizing the the assets out in the water and making sure that the inventory is getting to where it needs to be when it needs to get there and really just coordinating all those pieces i think ai is perfect for that so it sounds like we can save the whales and create efficiencies in that overall supply chain process as well. So we're that's, really on a, a high start. <laughs> that's true. And that's what we're trying to do on the show. You know, we, we have, yeah. uh, we're setting the bar pretty high. We want to help digital transformations and save the world all at the same time. That's the goal Absolutely. of transformation ground control. Amen to that. Well, let's just bring it right back down to misery and talk about the automotive industry's supply chain. Um, no, it's actually, it's a good story. It, it talks about kind of the comeback. So just sharing again, some statistics. So America in the US, our, our largest automaker is General Motors. They've really struggled with the overall chip shortage because we don't make them domestically here in the United States, or at least we didn't. So when COVID hit, that was a huge issue in that blockage. And uh, so they said by the end of June, it was able to clear out inventory of roughly 75% of the 90,000 vehicles that they haven't been able to complete because of missing parts. So that was the first part of their strategy was to actually fix what they had as far as incomplete inventory. Uh, and they um, they actually, their company worldwide car and truck deliveries rebounded about 1.5 million up from 17% earlier this year and 8% above the second quarter of 2022. Uh, so the the first nine months of deliveries are still 9% below 2021, so still a slow build. Uh, the issue is they now have their supply chain fixed and being able to at least get the, the um, cars in the manufacturing, which we all know will kind of be a delayed effect to actually get them on the lots to be able to sell. The issue is the falling global economy. Uh, typically the first thing to go in a global recession is auto sales. And so I wanted to see if you felt like that drop in demand would help the supply chain um, kind of catch back up, or if you feel like that drop in global demand is just going to continue to kind of create turmoil and challenges for this industry. It's a good question. I, I My gut tells me that if there is a silver lining to the global inflation and economic weakness that a lot of the world is facing right now, it may be that it's a chance for supply chains to get caught up. Because if you think about it, this is stuff, it didn't just happen in 2022. This is stuff going back to 2020 with, with the pandemic and the shutdowns and um, the, the pretty extreme drop in productivity throughout the world just because people couldn't work and factories had to close down for a certain amount of time. So we're still paying for that now. Um, 
and I, I don't know, it was, you didn't really see an end in sight uh, to that supply chain misery, as you put it, until the economy started getting weak and still until you started seeing significant inflation. I think cars will probably right size itself um, as a result of the economic weakness and inflation. But I guess my question would be more with more, uh, uh, what's it called? Fundamental commodity stuff like food, food and beverage, um, that might be a different story because that typically doesn't drop off as quickly as automotives uh, demand does when when the economy gets weak. So I think for the uh, automotive space, it might be a good thing. It might actually help sort of balance things out a little bit more, but I don't know where, even though this was not at all your question, I'm not sure how we address that in food and other uh, survival-based uh, types of industries. Yeah, absolutely. I did see a story about how fast food has actually um, gone up by a significant price increase, which is the first time companies like Starbucks and things like that have actually raised their prices in a very long time. So it's um, it's definitely felt uh, um, among all of the different industries. And we kind of like talked about last week, the food and beverage side has a specific challenge in supply chain because obviously there has to it has to get there um, cooled and um, protected by different FDA standards and uh, here in, in um, the U S and globally as well. So um, yeah. definitely interesting challenges for a variety of different organizations. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of cars, we have a few car stories. Um, I wanted to profile some flying cars that we've seen um, kind of emerge at higher end technical trade shows so, for example, um, at Draper University in San Mateo, California, they uh, a, a company, um, it's called Alif, I believe, is starting its Model A, and it's the first true flying car, as they call it. And it looks like a, a Tesla meets kind of the Batmobile, if I do my best visualization of describing it. Uh, but it can take off and fly for 68 miles or 110 kilometers. And it really hopes to rival air car and then the Palo V gyrocopter, which is a flying car and helicopter all in one. So a lot of conversations in this marketplace have been about what is there a real need for when it comes to autonomous vehicles and flying cars? So for example, this is really going a direct to the consumer as, a, as opposed to a B2B play for flying cars. And so I want to tell you a little bit about how this works, just so you can kind of visualize it. So they have the assistance of wings, and they have um, eight different jets under it, so motors that actually pick it up off the air. And then if you've seen how the black fly flies, it turns on its side and flies that way using um, wings to, you know, actually swivel the cockpit so the driver remains facing forward and the car becomes a biplane as they call it so um there's two wings and then it's easier to mesh between if you are on roads they have a video visualization too if you want to check it out again it's a lift and model a uh so the the thing that they've gotten feedback of from investors is how in the world would this ever be a need in the marketplace? And there's so much regulation that would have to go into flying cars, just as we've started to kind of look into for drone deliveries, drone passenger vehicles, which we've seen a lot of um, of, of that in, in the actual marketplace. So obviously wanted to talk to you about is, can you over innovate? Can you over innovate into a need that is not even close to being directly in a marketplace or is is this a smart long play for them to be creating in a in an area that nobody really is yet well i think to answer your question can you over innovate i'd say yes for sure um there's a whole book in school of thought um that book innovators dilemma by i think it's clayton christensen uh, wrote the book called innovators dilemma and that whole book is about how companies on the bleeding edge of innovation oftentimes are the first to fail because they're entering uncharted territory. Um, the mainstream adoption hasn't caught up to the, that innovation yet. And someone always inevitably comes along and figures out how to build a better mousetrap from that initial innovation. So I'm oversimplifying the premise of the book, but that's the general gist of what the book talks about. 
Um, so, but having said that, you know, you think about like electric cars, if you thought about electric guitar, electric cars, 20 years ago, it seemed kind of weird. It was kind of a weird idea. And it, I remember first hearing about it, you know, in the late nineties, maybe early 2000s, it just seemed like a really weird thing that would never stick. And clearly it is sticking and throughout the world, you know, there's, we've even gone so far as to put regulations or legislation in place to mandate more electric cars. So I think it's uh, just because I think you can't over innovate doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't innovate. I think that's what creates a lot of the innovations in the world. I just think there's, there's probably, I think you mentioned a couple of things that were on my mind too, with the uh, regulation of uh, drones and how big of a problem that's been for Amazon and others. I can't even imagine how you'd regulate cars that are flying in the air over, you know, protected airspace or how do you avoid crashes? Like how do you ensure that people are like yeah. flying or the way they should be? how do you have a be? license? Like it, do you need yeah. a regular license or a pilot's license? Like what does that look like? So Yeah. Is it more dangerous to fly a car, <laughs> uh, a flying car? I would imagine it probably is. It might yeah, be faster, probably. but it might be. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of, a lot of un- un- unanswered questions, but who knows, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, um, it won't seem so weird. Just like electric cars aren't so weird uh, now. Um, now, having said that, I mean, it's been like 40 years since Back to the Future. And, you know, when Martin McFly said roads where we're going, we don't need roads. And then he, he takes off in his DeLorean that starts flying. So the vision has been there for a long time, but it's interesting to hear that it's potentially becoming reality in some ways. Yeah. And that's actually, um, they profile um, Marty McFly and the Back to the Future car. And one of their slogans is where we're going, we don't need roads. Um, oh, nice. So. And it, I mean, it, it's funny and it's, um, it's interesting, you know, that that creativity was there at, at one point in our overall history, but also really cool to see kind of these newer things come out. I think it, it's either going to be like a slow build or we're going to solve all of those problems about how do you create a product, a public facing product that is that heavy, that needs that much battery that, you know, is, is, um, is electric? How do you create more charging stations? All of these things. So I think there's a huge push in the marketplace to understand at least the infrastructure around it. So we'll see if if that kind of sticks. But the trouble with autonomous vehicles or when you talk about something as vulnerable as driving and transportation, I think, you know, you go to the airplane and we always joke that all society standards go out the window when it comes to airports. Like people just, you walk through the door and they just lose their mind. So you think about (laughs) about that is still something that we haven't been able to kind of figure out is airline travel, at least here in the United States. I think um, other places globally are much better at it than we are. But, um, you know, how will you kind of create that perception of safety and um, understand what what that looks like and who knows maybe autonomous technology can help with that similar to the whales and the fact that it can regulate speeds and you know directions and all those kind of different things but my what a time to be alive marty mcfly would be so excited i know and uh what's his name doc yeah doc brown yeah doc Uh, brown yeah but i think you're bringing up some change management issues too which i know we're going to cover late in the third segment of this episode we're going to get into change management deliverables, but uh, it is a change management issue. You're just getting people past all the fears and anxieties that they're inevitably going to have as it relates to flying cars. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of change management, my last kind of fun, lighthearted, hot topic today um, that I wanted to share with our audience um, that actually is a real thing. We've talked about the emergence of artificial intelligence in music and using data from previous tracks to actually automate what that future track could look like when it comes to specifically hip hop. That's when, where it's really emerged. We talked about our TikTok artists that really have taken off that, you know, tens of millions of followers uh, that are, are big fans and and the music industry, you can see a shifting of fear around what does that look like for future artists? So they profile Taylor Swift specifically in this research because Taylor Swift's album, and forgive me, I'm not a huge Taylor Swift fan myself, but I know it dropped recently and crashed Spotify, which is obviously a a massive streaming platform um, and huge disruption because they weren't prepared. It was released at midnight. I'm not sure if they just weren't thinking that she had the momentum to get that amount of users on the platform at midnight, but she does. So let me just answer that question. (laughs) 
for, good to know. For you. I yeah. mean, I was one of them, obviously. Clearly, oh, I'm her target sure. audience. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think Taylor Swift is, you know, I admire her for sure. It's just I am on the older side of the Taylor Swift generation. So, um, but actually, the Recording Industry Association in America um, actually put together some legislation for the U.S. government's trade office of representatives that expressed these fears and said there are several tools that are being used to essentially plagiarize artists' voices. So you can take, um, and I'll give you an example. My mom is Eric's biggest fan and loves his voice. Um, so he, he, she would like to copy his voice <laughs> and create content about around that. Um, super weird, but you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> I would say hello um, to Mrs. Cheatham, but I just realized that's not her name. Yeah. That's, I, not, I don't that's know your my mother-in-law's so. name. Yeah. yeah. But Mrs. Wortman, she's a popular principal in the Colorado area. So <laughs> anyway, anyway shout out. Now that we're talking about her on the show, she now suddenly she's famous. That's <laughs> I know. Right. Right. That's how it works here at ground control. So, um, <laughs> However, so there's no legal imperative that stops an AI-generated piece of content um, from using a human-generated music. Uh, so that's what they're seeing is the issue as far as is that technology. And the change management issue here is we see a lot in the enterprise technology space. The evolution of technology has not matched the evolution of the industry. So for example, when synthesizers came out, instead of avoiding them or being fearful of them, many musicians invented new styles. We saw things like techno, hip hop, post-punk, a new wave music, all these new genres coming out, but still artists that kind of championed and amplified those. Um, now that technology has accelerated even further to having to eliminate the artist, the computer is the artist, if you will. Um, it obviously has um, created some disruption in that industry. Hmm. What they did a poll around this within the music industry. And what we see is the very component we see the need for the human side of AI. When an artist like Taylor Swift is on stage to sing a song, it completely immerses in a different experience that's not possible with AI generated music or say a robot. Uh, so there is very much still a human component. It just might not be those little subgenres can be now filled with computer based audio um, and actual music. So this research was trying to put at put that fear at bay that we're not going to lose the Beyonce's, the Taylor Swift's, you know, the, the Beatles, even though they have done some pretty crazy stuff with the Beatles AI, I went down a small rabbit hole on that one um, of what they've been able to do, especially since, you know, uh, they're not a, a, a band anymore. Um, but there still is very much a human component of artificial intelligence. So I, I saw a lot of parallels from the music industry to the enterprise industry um, about the change of that evolution, the speed of it, but then also the need for that human dynamic within a business, just like the music industry. And since you're obviously a huge music fan as well, I wanted to kind of see what your feedback was on that hmm. overall evolution. Hmm. I don't know. I've, I've sort of mixed feelings on it. I, I guess, uh, you know, the p musical purist in me doesn't like it, you know, as far as, you know, I like the human um, creation piece of it. I think, though, you know, it makes you wonder. I wonder, I've always read about in more recent years in the last, call it decade or two decades, maybe, I've read about um, producers that intentionally try to mimic sounds that have been successful in the past without flat out plagiarizing. So whether it's a beat or a riff or something that they try to replicate in a new song. So I, I think we're always aspiring to sort of tap into whatever works or, or expand on and build on what's worked in the past, um, which I think AI could help with that. So I, I like it as sort of like a, I don't know, uh, a data point to maybe provide some creative inputs into the creative process. But I don't know that I'd necessarily be a huge fan of just a pure AI, you know, creating some sort of, um, new music. Who knows though? I mean, maybe I'd hear it and love it and think, wow, that's amazing. No human could ever create something like that. But I, I guess until I heard it, I, I just wouldn't know. I know we played, um, there's a few, several episodes ago, a few months ago, we had the AI 
uh, hip hop artist, right? The, the, the first hip hop artist that was using AI. Yeah. So I have I that one data point, but that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely interesting. I think we need like a, a panel, an AI, like music specialist, technical music specialist to play like, this is Bob Seeger and this is Bob Seeger's AI avatar oh. and see if we can actually tell the difference. Um, that I feel like that's the only way for us to really know. Um, if we're we're able to you know tell an imposter from a, an actual artist, I feel like you crossed a line a little bit there with Bob Seger. I feel like AI with Taylor Swift's one thing, but you can't you can't do that to Bob Seger's. I mean, he's classic. You can't. <laughs> I I think that's the place that it's really it's really diluted, and we won't like nerd out on music too much. But I think the the classic rock, the you know the classic artist are what they're trying to resurrect mm. um, and kind of build off of. And I, I think it's cool to an extent, but to put all of the data points of a Beatles song, again, my rabbit hole, and then and then produce an actual Beatles song, I don't know, in a way feels unauthentic and, and honestly a little bit creepy if you if you ask me. But, you know, I'm sure many people would be interested in that, so... Yeah, I like your idea, though, of maybe doing a little more research or, or maybe uh, playing a couple samples for the audience here. Like, you know, tell us which one of these is real versus AI or which one do you like better, the AI version or the human version? Um, that might be a fun exercise for a future episode. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, some fun topics today. And then uh, we also get into kind of a this or that um, on your live stream talking about some different software selections or software vendors. Um, for enterprise. So really interesting conversation. Excited for that. Yeah, absolutely. That's our, that's our next segment. Uh, we're going to have Adam Cheatham on the show and Adam who's been on the show several times in the past and is also married to Kyler. Uh, coincidentally, that's, uh, I guess it's not really coincidental. I mean, we know you because of Adam and I've known Adam for a long time, so it's, it, it's not really coincidence, but whatever it, you guys are married. He's, you're our marketing director. He's our, uh, managing director of, of consulting. And he's going to be on the show to talk about, to talk with me about uh, some of the leading ERP systems in the market. What are the best systems that you should be thinking about in terms of a short list or potential deeper dive um, as you think about your enterprise technologies in 2023 and beyond. So we're going to uh, take a quick break and we'll have Adam on the show to talk about those leading ERP systems and pros and cons. And we're also going to take audience questions. So stick around for that. Uh, but first, we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 92. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So whether you're on Spotify, Amazon, Google, Apple, or wherever you're listening to podcasts, be sure to subscribe to us there. I'm excited for our next segment here. Our next guest is Adam Cheatham, who's a repeat guest on the show. He's a managing director of consulting here in the US, but he works with our global teams on software evaluations and software implementations throughout the world. And so we really wanted to get his global perspective and his take on what some of the pros and cons are with leading enterprise technologies and ERP systems. So all that being said, Adam, welcome to the show. Of course, glad to be on again. Yeah, so you were uh, first just to get this out of the way. You were recently promoted at Third Stage. This is not this is outside the scope of today's conversation, but it is worth mentioning before we jump in that you've recently been promoted. Maybe tell us a little bit about um, that. 
Yeah, so I suckered this guy I work for into convincing <laughs> <laughs> no, him uh, after four years. <laughs> um, no, so um, you know it's been an awesome journey at, at Third Stage over the last four years. Um, you know, we um, had have had a lot of different conversations about how the company grows and what's an important part of <clears throat> creating that growth. And it, it's always been connected to addressing a need in the marketplace and uh, and identifying that. And that's been a um, a ton of fun to see because we get a chance to see a lot about what's happening in the world from a, a number of different points of view and different industries and, and those types of things. And as, as we've kind of grown as a company and <clears throat> started taking on different types of clients and different types of industries and different types of projects, um, just have really uh, started as a company here at Third Stage, we've started to really thrive in the selection, PMO uh, space, OCM spaces that have uh, led to quite a lot of growth and, um, you know, being a part of the organizational uh, change that's been a part of that and leading some of it and eventing it along the way has been an exciting journey. So I'm uh, looking forward to the next challenge here and, and looking at what it is we can do to be more uh, in touch with what's going on around the world and what people need so that we can keep uh, doing this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations on, on the, Motion, of course, and um, this is it's been a few weeks now and uh, you're still getting settled into the role and it's a new role at our company. So it, we're, we're still defining a lot of what, what it looks like. Um, but you've been I've worked with you previously to third stage for a couple of years at, at Panorama and then now uh, four years plus here at third stage. Mm -hmm. So over this time, you've you've sort of escalated in the organization and been a key part of the organization from the start. And you've got to see a lot of different software evaluations and selections. Mm -hmm. and, and more recently, in the last year or so, you've gotten more involved with some of our international clients and our international teams. So I think you're a perfect guest for this discussion because not only are you very senior within the organization, but you've had more like a bigger purview of, of all the different project teams and um, geographies that we work. And, and so I think that'll be an interesting perspective as it relates to different uh, ERP systems here uh, in the market. Um, I guess just to start, you know, what I was going to do today, I thought is um, I actually have an upcoming YouTube video that's going to get released probably three weeks from now, maybe two weeks from now uh, on my YouTube channel. And it's uh, the top 10 most selected ERP systems. And so I've done a lot of top 10 rankings, you know, based on company size and industry and all that kind of stuff. But this is the first time we've done a top 10 ranking of the systems that were most selected by our clients. And it was just an interesting exercise that you actually helped us compile, which was looking at over the last couple of years, what are those systems that we most commonly recommended and selected to uh, different organizations throughout the world? And so I've got that list in front of me, and I was just going to kind of go through some of the some of the vendors that show up on that list to get us started. And then, of course, um, if the audience has questions or wants to talk about certain technologies that we're not yet talking about, uh, certainly would love to hear any any suggestions or any suggested vendors you want us to cover? Or if you've got questions about the vendors we are covering, please please chime in with any any comments there. So I'm going to not go down the list one by one, but I'm going to pick some of the bigger names. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're maybe more commonly recognized to start. Um, and why don't I start with um, one of the ones that landed in our top five um, was SAP S4 HANA. And, and, and SAP mm -hmm. is, you know, the, the largest... ERP software vendor in the marketplace. It's used by a lot of Fortune 500 companies, a lot of global companies. But maybe tell us some, maybe you could give us a couple examples or maybe general situations where S4 HANA, SAP S4 HANA makes a lot of sense for an organization to consider. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that the first, the first and foremost thing to recognize about S4 HANA is that it's a massive software system, right? So we're not talking about small, medium-sized businesses that tend to go for that. We're talking about big ones. Um, very often, you know, larger than a half a billion um, in highly complex industries. <clears throat> it takes a long time to implement, um, and it's, it's highly complex. But I would actually say that it's one of the, uh, if not the most, mature software package in the uh, modern industry right now. It's very close to it because it's... Um, the way that they've transitioned from the old ECC6 platform to the, the um, suite on HANA and the SAP S4 HANA stuff is, has been a more gradual transition as opposed to kind of the, um, the sharp, we're just going to recode it for the cloud conversation. I think that that's led to a lot of success for SAP and a lot of smoothness in that. Um, 
the SAP has a lot of brand recognition as too, so, too. So you see a lot of companies that end up moving from ECC six to S four HANA um, and keeping that in house. Um, especially with the way the teams have grown and um, around that platform. But I would, um, I wouldn't say that there's any industry that it can't handle. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not it's um, it's exactly the right fit for you, right? This doesn't mean that I'm not saying SAP S4 HANA is going to win every competition that it's ever in. Um, it's certainly lost a few, um, especially with the complexity of the implementation itself and the heaviness of the product. But um, I'd say that if you, if you have the the wherewithal, the complexity needs and requirements that um, SAP S4 HANA is certainly a, a valid consideration for your business. Yeah. Yeah, and that HANA platform is, is pretty interesting too, just because it it um, you know has that real time memory and it's 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 meant to provide higher performance to organizations because of the HANA platform and it mm -hmm. also gets them off the Oracle database stack, which it was always a little strange that SAP was such fierce competitors with Oracle, but yet at the same time they were a customer of, of Oracle mm -hmm. by using their databases for some of the older versions of SAP, but now they've got this HANA platform that sort of replaces Oracle and also provides a whole new architecture for, yeah. uh, for SAP, which is pretty interesting. Well, if Amazon ever decides to enter the ERP space, a lot of companies are in trouble in the same way. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I never thought of that, but that um, with AWS and Amazon Web Services, um, it doesn't seem that far-fetched actually for, the, for Amazon to potentially <laughs> provide systems in, in the future. What about, um, you know, one thing that's interesting about SAP as well while we're talking about it is um, I know back in the day, 10, 20 years ago, SAP was sort of known for developing its own integrated system. You know, it's, it's sort of like it's its own greenfield system that they developed on their own. But in more recent years, in the last decade, they've gone out and acquired different companies like Ariba and Success Factors for the human capital management, Concur for time and expense reporting, business objects. So they've acquired all these different companies and they're sort of creating this pseudo best of breed model, almost like what Oracle was doing, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see that affecting either the, the evaluation of SAP and or the implementation of SAP? Does it, does it change anything in your mind just in the last few no. years? I would say that um, I'd like to see that become a bit more mature. Um, you know, everybody that I've seen, um, try to try to tie those together still has a lot of grow there's still a bit of growing pains in that they feel like they're integrating different um different software systems even though the logo is the same um i think it's a it's an it's certainly a an interesting tactic given that the overall approach to solving some of the more niche based needs is is being addressed uh, especially as you see a lot of other software packages in the industry not be such as a, a mature package. I'm a, um, I'm a big believer of the idea that it took a long time to build the older systems, right? 30 years of development doesn't go away um, in those systems, but it doesn't get migrated overnight to the cloud either. And so when you start talking about most other systems, you end up with a best of breed challenge to serve more niche based needs so kind of picking off some of those things that are the low hanging fruit and buying them up i think is a really smart strategic move yeah yeah and they they um, also provide options too you know if, if their module can't handle a certain function the way that a customer might want it to they've got these options with reba and success factors one thing yeah. that i find interesting i don't know if you you've seen this or not but one thing i find interesting though in the market with SAP customers is it seems like there's not a lot of thought that goes into like, which systems are we actually getting or do we need? It seems like a, you know, a lot of the big system integrators and SAP as a company tends to position this whole package solution that includes a, um, Ariba and success factors and concur and all these, these edge solutions. Um, I don't know if you've seen that as well, but it seems like a lot of companies are just over investing in the technology stack in some ways because a lot of them don't use all that capability. Yeah. And I think that the, Epicor is doing something similar as well, where they're kind of buying up a lot of little little things here and there, where they're filling a lot of different types of technology gaps, especially as, as it pertains to things like automation and stuff like that. So I think that it's a um, it's the fastest way to fill the gaps in the software package that you don't have already developed, right? That you take that maturity model that used to be, 
and you rebuild something and then you have holes right now you can buy things to fill those holes with more modern technology um, that somebody else has already done all the legwork so I think that's a pretty common um, common approach right now and I think we're, we're probably going to see a lot more uh, with it I mean, it's um, interesting that you bring it up that way I'd be curious as to what you're seeing as well since you've got some of the um, the more exposure to the whole um, industry at a different level than I do yeah it's I mean it it's um I, I think it's they're still working on making it an integrated solution and, and I think even in some cases the system integrators and implementation partners don't fully understand in which situations do I need for example success factors versus just the core HCM module or um, you know do I really need that additional module we're here talking about the leading ERP systems in the marketplace for 2023 and beyond we're going to have a lot more to cover we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back with more transformation ground control Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings and the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 92. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. I'm here with Adam Cheatham, and we're talking about the top ERP systems in the marketplace that you should be considering for 2023 and beyond. Mm -hmm. One comment, though, that I think is worth sharing that is kind of funny, or I think it's very funny, is from uh, Frederick on LinkedIn. It just came in, and he, and he said, SAP is integrated <laughs> on your invoice, um, which is pretty funny. Um, and it, but it's true. You, it is going to be an integrated solution that you're going to pay for on one invoice. Whether or not it's integrated as technology, I, I suppose, is a, is a different uh, story. So thanks for keeping us lighthearted here on a, on a Tuesday, uh, Frederick. I appreciate that. Um, I want to come back to maybe a couple other vendors as well um, in a moment, but I want to turn to the audience real quick because we've had a lot, of, a lot of good comments here, a lot of uh, at least a mention of where people are joining from today. Um, we have people from all over the world. We have uh, people from Denver, Colorado, which is where uh, I'm based. Adam is not too far from Denver. He's in Grand Junction, Colorado, on the western slopes of Colorado. Um, Frederick from Norway. Yuri from Frankfurt, Germany. Um, Avenaden from Poland. I'm sorry if I butchered your name, which it's highly likely I just did. Um, got someone from Newcastle, UK. Uh, Mexico with operations in the U.S., Ecuador, um, a lot of good uh, participation here. So thanks uh, everyone for joining from all over the world here today. And then someone from Canada. Um, I want to get to a question. It's a, it, it's a, it might, there's part of me that argues this might disrupt our flow a little bit, but I think it's a really good question that I think is worth uh, getting to here. And I'm just trying to find it because it came in early. Oh, here it is. So this question um is a great one. This is from Hamid on LinkedIn. He says, hi, Eric, what about developing its own ERP? Is this avenue still relevant? In which cases, any examples? And uh, Hamid is joining from Canada. So what are your thoughts on custom development, custom solutions? Is that ever a good idea when you've got these commercial off-the-shelf options available to you? Uh, well, custom solution is always an option, right? Um, and it generally is... Um is often more an option when you're talking about a system that you're trying to maintain and get as much as you can out of it. Now, I would say that the biggest challenge with the custom solution and building your own 
is the security component of it. Um, that's the hardest part because these larger companies, um, the larger you are, the more at risk you are, um, the more um, the more antiquated your system, the more at risk you are. So when you started to talk custom development, you had quite a lot of challenges with making sure that you have your cybersecurity ducks in a row. Um, that would be my biggest worry. Um, you know, at the end of the day, being uh, being one step faster than the guy behind you does certainly save you from an animal attack. Right. <laughs> um, so, and it's similar in, in the ERP space, right? So the um, people target the weakest links uh, from a perspective of cybersecurity. And if you're talking about a custom coded environment that makes you target on your own, um, but the, at the end of the day, um, it's always an option to consider uh, growing your own environment. You just had to make sure that you know you're taking on those risks yourself. Uh, whereas when you uh, when you look at some of the those top ten vendors in the industry, those are those risks are handled for you, um, especially in a cloud environment where you have more of the advantage of the the whole. Um, so that if that company is now responsible for everybody on a multi-tenant platform and there's one in and one out, right? So it's just more consolidated approach to defense, but yeah. it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to custom code your own software. Um, I've worked with companies, for example, that have uh, coded and implemented their own, um, their own iterations of Microsoft Dynamics Business Central, for example. You know, there are software packages where you can get the best of both both worlds, where you can have your hand on the wheel um, and um, have a, a modern ERP. Odoo is another great example um, from a perspective of having an open source platform that you really get an opportunity to build on your own. Um, again, you do take a lot more responsibility for that. But at the same time, on the flip side, you have the advantage of having all of those things in-house. So not having yeah. to pay those external costs. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point about, um, well, first of all, I think it's worth having an open mind, as you mentioned, as far as not totally ruling out custom development, because it, you know, it, it's it's probably pretty unlikely that an organization is going to benefit from its own entire enterprise-wide custom solution, just because there's so many solutions out there that could handle sort of at least the core of what you need, mm -hmm. unless you're in a super unique business, super unique industry, you have a highly sophisticated IT staff. Um, you're, you really are investing heavily in IT as a competitive advantage. Then, of course, there might be some rare instances like that where a custom developed solution might make sense. But you bring us a really good point about other options as far as sort of best of both worlds when you have uh, like a Microsoft Dynamics, where it's uh, not only is it a little bit more customizable than other solutions, but you also have these third party ISV providers that are providing industry focused or s sort of variations of the core software that are meant to fit certain solutions or certain scenarios. So maybe talk a little bit about, you mentioned Microsoft E365 and also Odoo. I think those are two good examples of systems that um, I'll g give you that additional flexibility. What are some of the pros and cons of say a Microsoft or Odoo, which both by the way, Microsoft rated very high. It was in our top three most recommended systems and then Odoo was sort of at the lower part of our top 10 list of, of most recommended systems across. Yeah. So I'd, I'd say that um, we'll start with Odoo. Um, that tends to be the, the, the trendier thought. It, we get a lot of folks that are on the uh, more on the bleeding edge of technology to want to know about Odoo. How could this work for us? And at the end of the day, it, the software system can be made to do anything you can make it do. <laughs> You know, that's the challenge, right? Can do you have that expertise? Are you willing to take that on in house? Um, and and that becomes the, the conversation on it. We had a um, you know, one of the times that we recommended Odoo, for example, was um, with a, a client whose product was very technically based. Um, it was it's a, um, a registry based product that has a lot of technology and algorithms and things behind it. So their focus is on software. So their their skill sets in-house are all built around that. They don't hire people that can't handle software. Um, so when you think about maintaining your own system and creating an integration with a technical product that's software based, um, you have a skill set to tap into. And so that there's less of a risk to your business model if you are if you already have that in-house. And that's really something that's 
Um, it's, it's generally one of the first early questions I ask folks who are into Odoo and, and, and looking at it is, can you handle this weight? You know, it's, um, especially for smaller companies. Um, it's a similar question for SAP, for example. Um, you know, we talked about that earlier. Um, can you handle this weight? And if the answer is no, then it, you need to be honest with yourself on that um, and get something where you can have a partner that can do that, which is on the flip side from a Microsoft perspective, um, you have that that conversation of it can do a lot, made to be do a lot of things. And I think that, you know, part of the uh, the reason Microsoft ends up rated so highly on our list is that they they have a couple of different products that in the Microsoft Dynamics suite that you have Business Central, which is more the smaller business side of things. And you have Finance and Supply Chain, which is the larger tier one product. Um, they're heavy implementations, they're big challenges, um, but you can have a lot more control over it. It's intended to be that way where, um, you know, there's a there's a flip side of, of every coin, right? With Microsoft Dynamics, the functionality is pretty wide ranging and it can do a lot of things if you can build it that way or you have a partner that can build it that way for you, which is a difference from an open source versus a, a, a more highly configurable platform like Microsoft. Um, so we see Microsoft work really well for folks that want to have a little bit more tinkering. Um, you know, I hear some, see some folks in here talking a little bit about NetSuite and things like that, that competes very well against both those products. Um, the difference there is that NetSuite um, has a lot of functionality, but it's built a very specific way. Um, and so you have a, quite a bit less functionality um, tweaking that you're, you're able to do. But at the same time, you know, that um, you have a critical mass of, of clients that allows for enhancements to the product itself. So instead of saying, I want to build this for myself, you can wait until that idea reaches that critical mass. And then that suite um, builds that, that functionality into the system and it goes to everybody. So it's just, it, it's a, it's a question you had to ask your organization do we want to take on this role or do we want to have a partner that can do that for us? Because none of these answers are wrong. Uh, we've, been, we've recommended all of those software packages that I just, that, that I just rattled off um, for various reasons, many of them being the functional fit. So, which is also the most important component of all of this. It doesn't matter if you can handle the weight or not, if the software is, doesn't do what you need it to, but there are ways of, of getting to the bottom on what it is that might feel like. Yeah, yeah. Great, great points. And um, just as a segue into a comment from Matthew on LinkedIn, um, he says, hey, Eric, Matt uh, Frasick from NetSuite here. I've learned a lot about ERP from listening to your videos and how they compare to the software I provide. Thank you for your content. So thank you for being here, Matthew. And of course, if you have uh, anyone, not just Matt from NetSuite, but anyone on the um, live stream here today that has comments or if you disagree with anything we're saying or you have anything to add, please drop it in the chat. We'd love to hear your feedback, even though we're not affiliated with software vendors, we're, we're wholly independent and technology agnostic. We understand that a lot of people on the call here are aligned with software vendors and they may have a different perspective. So we'd love to hear your feedback here. Um, but you, you started talking about uh, NetSuite and sort of in keeping with this theme of do we go with a, a more rigid off the shelf system or do we do something custom or do we do we do something in the middle, sort of a hybrid, another sort of hybrid option that, um, that made me think of this is, is when you talk about NetSuite, um, I know NetSuite is starting to do more of what like Salesforce has done where they've created more of an app, like a third party app exchange mm -hmm. where third party developers can create different apps and different um, systems that sort of are part of that platform, part of that NetSuite platform or part of the Salesforce or Force platform. Um, for just as a side note for anyone who may have may think of Salesforce as just a CRM system. They actually have their own platform that they've developed as well, which allows third-party developers to create other extensions to Salesforce and create more manufacturing ERP types capabilities or more financial capabilities, whatever the case may be. So you have other options to sort of piece together an enterprise with a wide solution within the ecosystem. So that's like, a, that's another hybrid option or a hybrid approach that some vendors are taking like Salesforce. I think NetSuite's starting to do that a little bit more. Have you seen our clients benefit from that or sort of what have you seen in the market, yeah. what our clients are doing? 
I think that, um, from the NetSuite that made for NetSuite environment is is really starting to expand quite a lot, um, and it's it continues to grow. It's it's been out there for a long time. I mean, NetSuite is the original cloud product, right? right. Um, so there's there's a lot to be said for that. But I think from a perspective of that made for NetSuite environment in that next outer circle, um, I think that's a really dynamic model where. You get a lot of options as far as like the the, the app store, if you will, um, and you get a lot of chances to grow your package, right? So um, if NetSuite, for whatever reason, doesn't fit a specific type of requirement for you, you have a very niche need in one space or another, that made for NetSuite uh, network really comes into play where I've seen them um, compete really well in some of the areas like um, advanced demand planning and advanced manufacturing that um, you know, it seems like you know, the M4s, the Epicores, the uh, Oracle ERP cloud package uh, approach is more to have a specific in-house built advanced module. Um, that's what goes to their network. And I think that that's really kind of a neat opportunity uh, for, for a lot of companies to have more options as opposed to just the one advanced module. On the flip side, um, it does make you more beholden to more companies, right? It's um, made for NetSuite is not NetSuite. That can't be more clear. And the more made for NetSuite add-ons you have, the more you start to feel like you're building a disparate best of breed environment that's, that's tied together. They're all using a common language, which solves one of the, the, the major challenges of development and, and integration on the whole. Um, but you still have multiple partners with multiple different approaches and multiple different tactics for deployment. And those types of things that um, can be a bit overwhelming if you really start to um, add on too much. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. In fact, um, one of our current expert witness engagements addresses that exact fact. So we, we're uh, <laughs> often hired not only to help clients select software, not only help them implement software, but we're also hired by lawyers to be expert witnesses to testify in cases or lawsuits involving ERP systems. And one of them does involve NetSuite and one of its, uh, not one of its partners, but one of its third party systems. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of controversy in that case over was it NetSuite? Was it not? Should the implementer have understood this third party solution mm -hmm. because it was built on NetSuite? A lot of questions that are still unresolved and unanswered in that case. Um, and I think that's, it's a really good point because I think a lot of organizations do struggle with that, especially not, not just in this situation where um, you've got say a NetSuite or a Salesforce that has these third party developers creating apps, but also just the vendor themselves that, that goes out and acquires these other systems. Like we, we talked about SAP and how they acquired success factors and Ariba mm -hmm. on the procurement side, you know, there's a lot of, um, SAP as, as a whole, the ecosystem of SAP doesn't understand or um, they're not as expert level in those third-party solutions as they are the core S4 HANA solution in general. That's a broad generalization, but in general, they're not. Mm -hmm. And that creates a lot of difficulty during implementation because finding the right resources and creating that truly integrated solution becomes a little bit more difficult when you start talking about either third-party bolt-ons or add-ons and or you know that best-of-breed model. Well, it's, it's all about how many cooks do you have in the kitchen, right? And yeah. and who's the master chef, right? Um, the, the master chef should be you in all those circumstances. But um, then that way you have an opportunity to make sure that everything's blending together appropriately. Um, and that's not just a NetSuite challenge. I, you know, I um, don't, want it, don't want our NetSuiters to... Uh, to feel like I'm beating them up for something that applies to everybody else. It's it's a challenge for everybody. And when you have a software vendor and you have a system integrator and then you have integrated bolt-ons that just complicate the, the scenario, um, getting all of those things to go live at the same time becomes more and more complex the more you pour into it. Yeah, yeah, very, very well said. Um, shifting gears a little bit, one vendor we have not talked about yet. We talked about NetSuite, which is owned by Oracle, but we have not yet talked about Oracle Cloud ERP. And uh, Avi, who I, that's the name I completely butchered a few minutes ago, but he corrected me and said, you can just call me Avi. So thank you for making my life easier and for not allowing me to butcher your name again. But Avi from LinkedIn says, how would you rate Oracle Cloud ERP for manufacturing industries? And this is a, you and I have had this conversation before about some of our manufacturing clients that have considered and in some cases implemented Oracle. But what are your 
just generally speaking, what are your thoughts around Oracle Cloud ERP for manufacturers? Yeah, um, it's a it's a highly dynamic platform and it grows every day. You know, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, Oracle has such an amazing um, wealth of experience and, and access from a research and development perspective, um, and they continue to grow every day, right? And that's something that I think is is really an important piece of the puzzle here because. Um, again, when you start talking about migrating from one place to a, from one more, um, we'll call it less modern ERP to something that is more modern, especially cloud-based, um, you know, there's a focus at Oracle on building that ERP cloud product and, and, and making it work for everybody. And Oracle has some of the most dynamic um, experience across the software industry and, and resources to draw on. Um, largely because they've uh, of that acquisition based model of the past that they've been so heavy into, you know, it's um, JD Edwards. Um, we still find people that are, um, and it's not, I mean, it's not once in a blue moon, like there, we still find people that are enamored with and, and just fanatics about JD Edwards and the manufacturing functionality that's inherent in that. And, you know, that's not to say that you get the same system in Oracle ERP cloud, but you do have those resources that, that translate in house. And you see a lot of that uh, knowledge transfer from software to software when you start having people grow within the industry. So um, Oracle ERP cloud, a very, very dynamic um, product. I would say that it's just as, uh, just as well, uh, well versed in manufacturing as SAP. It's just a matter of exactly how they match up with your requirements on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, JD Edwards and I totally agree with what you're saying about JD Edwards, which is there are a lot of JD Edwards fanatics and diehards out there. Um, just like there was with, you know, IBM AS400 and I-Series, you know, people, there's just, just, there's not as, they're not as common now as they were 10 or 20 years ago, but there for a long time, you had people that were just diehard mainframe enthusiasts because it was so stable and it just gave you certain benefits that newer technology uh, didn't. And same with J.D. Edwards. It was so focused on manufacturing. Um, they happen to be based here in Denver where Third Stage is based. That's where J.D. J. Edwards, start, J. D. Edwards started. And uh, so we know a lot of people in that ecosystem just based on proximity. But I think it's worth bringing it up, though, because a lot of these legacy systems like J.D. Edwards, which is a great example, was built for manufacturing, used by a lot of manufacturers for decades, and then you ex you know you expect an organization to move from JD Edwards now to Oracle Cloud ERP, and you lose some stuff there. You know, the, you, Oracle Cloud ERP is just not JD Edwards. It hasn't been around as long. Um, it's not Ooh. as focused as JD Edwards was in the manufacturing space. So you're just going to lose a certain amount of functionality. And even Oracle EBS, um, the eBusiness Suite, which is the predecessor to uh, cloud ERP, uh, there's generally more manufacturing capability in that solution just because it hit the benefit of being around for longer. And eventually this will become a moot point as Oracle Cloud and some of these other vendors get caught up with their cloud solutions and it becomes as mature as their old on-premise systems. But in the meantime, that transition becomes difficult for a lot of organizations like the diehard JDE enthusiasts but it's highly likely they're going to be disappointed in Oracle Cloud ERP, not because it's a bad solution, yeah. Because it's not JD Edwards. Is that something you see with not just the Oracle customers, but others yes. as well? Um, what um, that, that's funny because I had a, a client who was um, dead set on look, we we just want to buy more JDE. How do I do that? Um, right. that's, that's all I want is I want more JDE. How do I, how do, I do that? It's like um, it's definitely difficult. It's not unheard of. Um, you know, at, um, I had a client. Um, go through an uh, JDE implementation as recent as the last couple of years. Um, but at the same time, it's um, there are other software packages out there that feel a bit more uh, modern. And I, I would say that um, to, to completely not answer your question at all, um, I would say that <laughs> no, <by the> way. <laughs> uh, to, to go from an EBS, for example, to an Oracle ERP cloud, you're going to have gaps. Um, because there's just not as much time to transition that functionality. Um, I would also say that the, the manufacturing industry, for example, continues to evolve as well. So some of the needs of the past um, start to become less important. So it's not like you need to migrate 100% of what EBS or JDE does, because some of those things become obsolete. 
So there's a there's a balance there and kind of seeing where the modern software surpasses uh, the you know the more um, established software packages. And that's something that's just going to kind of take time as an industry to, to get past. And when you start thinking about the idea of can I get the same manufacturing functionality if I move from JDE or from software A to more modern version of software A um, or A.2, whatever you want to call it? Um, the answer is really technically not really, um, but uh, that's where change management becomes important, right? You don't necessarily need it to work exactly the way it always has in, in all cases. Um, you just need to know where it needs to work exactly the same way as it always had in very specific scenarios that are critical to the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Makes a ton of sense. Um, a couple of comments here that I, I wanted just to point out here. Um, apparently, we hit a nerve with this uh, custom the custom development discussion that always makes, uh, that always makes for interesting conversation, but, uh, but AV over on, uh, LinkedIn, uh, who, by the way, his firm is also in the Inc 5,000, uh, fastest growing companies in America. So congratulations to him as well as third stage for being on that list. Um, but AV says, Kyler talking about custom ERP is making me nervous. So we've made at least one person nervous. We've triggered at least one person on this, on this conversation. Um, and then Kyler, uh, you know, Kyler commented that it is, it is indeed a trigger. We're here talking about the leading ERP systems in the marketplace for 2023 and beyond. We're going to have a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 92. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. I'm here with Adam Cheatham, and we're talking about the top ERP systems in the marketplace that you should be considering for 2023 and beyond. But I did want to share this comment from Sam Graham, who I'm, by the way, I'm determined to have Sam on this show someday. Uh, he's, he's declined my request so far, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep trying until he's on this show because he always has such good comments. Uh, but Sam says, uh, one large pharma company wrote their own ERP system. They invested 600 man years in it. By the time it was finished, the company changed direction and the new system didn't fit its needs. It never went live. So interesting case study and data point, anecdotal, of course, but it is a good example of the risk of doing a custom solution is that it's going to take you a long time. It's going to be pretty expensive and you better be pretty clear on what your business model is and what your future direction is. Because if you change course, it, it you know, the flexibility that you miss out on by having a custom solution can be a problem. Um, I think of like, you know, an example of where custom might make sense, though a custom developed solution would be like a, you think of like DoorDash or or Grubhub or one of the delivery services or Uber, you know the the um, the car uh, sharing service. So you think about business models that are built on an entirely new technology. Those might be rare instances where custom development does make sense. But if you're a, a manufacturer or a consumer product company, chances are pretty heavy, pretty high, highly likely that you're going to find 60, 70, 80 percent of what you need in some sort of custom solution or some sort of off the shelf solution. And you can always just fill the gaps with point custom solutions rather than trying to build it all from scratch. So um, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but that was uh, uh, seemed to be a, a common thread here in the comments in the chat. Um, I, I think there's a uh, now a, to, to make people nervous for a little bit longer. I think that <laughs> custom development is something that you shouldn't entirely rule out. Right. Um, cloud, packages, especially multi-tenant platforms, are designed to in, um, eliminate 
customization, which means it eliminates options, right? You are stuck with what you get. And that's it's the same for everybody. That's how a multi-tenant platform works. Now, there are lots of folks that will tell you, well, yeah, well, you can do this or you can do that, but it's still within the same boundaries, right? There's, you know, these software systems are growing quite a lot more configurable. Um, but if you need a very specific solution, custom code can do you a lot of favors. Um, now, I, that being said, I, custom code also makes me nervous because <laughs> right. you have to maintain it and that becomes your problem. And, and then um, you have to maintain all the endpoints and one customization begets another. So it has a, a bit of a snowball effect, um, but it, it does have a place and it's um, your job is to figure out whether or not that place is appropriate for you. Yeah, absolutely. Makes, makes total sense. Um, here's a question from... Uh... Satyam on YouTube, and he says, would love to hear how to independently do ERP comparisons on detail at the detailed process level in order to know which ERP platforms or in order to know which ERP performs any given operation best. So maybe just in general, without we could spend the whole hour talking about just how to evaluate potential systems, but just at a high level, what are some of the ways you can independently and agnostically evaluate the options that are available in the marketplace? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a fantastic question, and to um, to narrow it down to something that's um, too narrow to really have have a, a lot of usefulness as far as the process is concerned. But what you're going to focus on is the software requirements that make it different for you. Um, you know, you you want to get to a detailed level of requirements, and then know which ones of your requirements are going to drive a differentiation. Um, you can bring in a partner to help with that and, and say these ones are this, these ones fit this one, these ones fit those ones. Um, or you can ask the vendors directly themselves. Um, <clears throat> how do you fit these specific requirements? The key again is that that comment that you made that um, you want to get the vast majority of your, your functionality out of the box, um, especially for the things that don't matter, right? Um, when shipping is uh, is confirmed, it sends an invoice. That's boom, boom. That's not something that you should use as a differentiator on your software because everybody does it. Um, but when you have more complex needs that are more unique to your competitive advantage in the marketplace, getting nitty gritty on those solutions and what it is one software package does versus the other is really the key to finding the right package for you. And then the rest of it just becomes a change management challenge. Knowing the difference between why it has to be that way and why it can't be different uh, versus uh, what what's good change management protocol is, is really the key in figuring out how you know which software package meets your most specific, unique and complex needs. So the, focus on those things from a perspective of if, you, if you're going to go out there and try to figure it out, focus on what makes a difference to your business and what makes you unique and then and then get there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, augmenting what you're saying with some text or with a comment here from Kyler, who is part of the third stage team. Um, and her comment here is it's a balance. That's why having an expert on your side and only your side is so important and that is just as a shameless plug here that is the value the third stage provides is that we are independent we are not paid by software vendors we make absolutely no money off any sort of recommendation which is what makes us unique and which is why so many clients hire us to help figure out what technology fits best we also have a, a database a proprietary database and tool that we use uh, to plug in some of those higher priority requirements that you're talking about adam that helps us quantify and objectively quantify the differences and the strengths and weaknesses of different solutions against different requirements and different functions. So that independent agnostic or technology agnostic angle, as well as the tool set to help with the selection are two things that were, um, that are very important. Um, what about, um, this, uh, speaking of Kyler, this is another question, um, who, by the way, just fun fact, Kyler is Adam's wife, um, and is our marketing director and also my podcast co-host so it's a very small world we're living in here um but uh, kyler says what what should organizations do if their system is being sunsetted which seems to be a common thing lately and in fact speaking of triggers you have probably written the most controversial and triggering <laughs> blog on your website which is talking about microsoft great plains and the sun setting of microsoft great plains and the microsoft community does not like the fact that we are talking about that so let's talk about it some more <laughs> <laughs> 
let's be fair. Everybody sunsets a software package. Yes. It, it, Not just Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft just seems to be pretty sensitive about it. Um, yeah. At least the, the system integrator industry um, is concerned. So um, if you find yourself in a position where your um, software package is being sunsetted, um, the first thing I would do is um, check the facts, right? System integrators will often tell you that it, uh, tell you two things, two, two things that are not always true. One, your software package is being sunsetted. You'll never get support for that ever again. And two, um, migrating to the newest, greatest version of that software package um, is just an upgrade. It's easy. Um, we'll use the Microsoft Great Plains example again. Um, Microsoft has since they, uh, they made that announcement, walked that back. And from there, uh, we've had a lot of conversations with companies about what that means. But the two things that are that are important to remember there is even when Microsoft Great Plains sunsets, um, another industry will pop up to support it, right? It won't be Microsoft supporting it, but there will be people out there who will help you support that tool. So it's not an, um, an immediate, oh no, it's um, I've, I've got to get off this software because an industry will, the need will present itself to the market and the market will correct the, fill the gap, right? Especially with a product like Microsoft Great Plains. Um, one of the more, uh, uh, I'd say that JDE is probably one of the only one of the software packages that's more fan fanatical from its support and use perspective than than uh, Great Plains is. But the other side of this is the most important to remember is that migrating from a package like Great Plains to Microsoft Dynamics 365 Finance and Supply Chain. Is this is not that this is migrating from a traditional accounting package to that um, people built in my uh, manufacturing functionality to to a brand new something else. It won't be easier to migrate to Dynamics 365's uh, finance and supply chain um, just because it's Microsoft. It may actually for you, depending on your needs as a company, be easier to migrate to an Infor or an Epicor, which are um, two software packages that we find um, are real good contenders in the space as well that need to be considered. Because from an M4 perspective, they kind of compete in that, um, that uh, well, both these packages compete in that upper tier two space. Um, I'd say M4 feels like it competes at a little bit higher level than Epicor. Um, but at the same time, when you're talking about moving off of something that's kind of a Windows based um, ERP package that was mostly made for accounting back in the day. Cause I think if I remember right, uh, Microsoft Great Plains used to be Peachtree. Um, I might have that mixed up though. So if anybody in the audience knows, but certainly, um, could use a correction if there is one. Um, but it's at the end of the day, going to a new package is a new package, whether or not the logo on it is the same. Um, the parts aren't reusable. Um, when you start talking about that type of a change. So consider all of your options because in that in that environment, you may find that an M4 uh, or an Epicor brings a lot more manufacturing functionality than you ever thought an ERP package could um, because they're focused on that. Yeah. Whereas Great Plains really wasn't when it was built. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And um, Gasan on LinkedIn has a good comment, a good analogy here or metaphor. When one ERP sunsets, another ERP sunrises, and the one that at high noon can cause a serious sunburn. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't get sunburned or put on your sunblock. I suppose is the, the best advice we could give you there as it relates to ERP. Is um, that another analogy or metaphor for third stage? Now we are sunblock. Uh, that's actually you're onto something there. We do have our marketing team on this yes. on this live stream, so we're we're just Hopefully giving them we're listening. I hope they're listening because we are full of good ideas today. I mean, we've got it all figured out here. Um, so we covered in four and Epicor. That was actually a question from from Kyler as well. You 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 uh, you beat her to the punch on on addressing that. But what about? I'm going to pick a couple other vendors that are in our top ten most recommended uh, systems list, as well as in our top ten general ranking of sort of best features and functionality in the market. Uh, but another one we have not talked about yet is IFS. Maybe tell yes. us a little about IFS and where is that? Um, 
IFS is an interesting software package because it kind of is, uh, it's kind of a bit disruptive to the industry in that it doesn't play the game the way that the other vendors do, right? Um, I have seen IFS compete side by side against SAP S4 HANA and beat them, hands down, and not close. You know, it's, it's something that is um, designed for highly, highly complex manufacturing. And that's what they do. That's what they focus on. Um, they do have a good field service package as well um, from a field service management perspective. Um, but they are very focused on that complexity, um, especially when you're talking about manufacturing. Um, complexity creates challenges in, its, in, in and of itself. And IFS's challenge becomes if you can't pull it off, what do you do? Um, whereas if you have more of a, an SAP Oracle, you have more options. If you can't pull it off, you can fire your system integrator and bring in another one. Uh, there's a bit more of an industry around that. Um, and I see Gassam very up IFS. And interesting for some, is that the acronym? Is that what that stands for? <laughs> I, I saw that too. I was just about to pull it up, but I didn't want to distract. Um, so, um, but it's, um, it is a, um, a, a very complex package that can do quite a lot of things. And we find that from a traceability perspective, um, it, it's very, very uh, strong, um, especially when it, we're talking about aerospace and those types of industries. Um, the flip side of it is if you don't need that complexity, you, you're over, you'll be in over your head pretty quick. Um, I think it, uh, in these days too, when you mentioned IFS, you had to mention Acumatica, they are owned by the same company. Um, I think it was, three years ago, um, I forget the name of the private equity firm that bought both, but they bought them both pretty close to together as a private equity firm that um, seems to be targeting an ERP model. And and IFS has a corner of this uh, of the market that it's very secure in. Um, and Acumatica is also a great product that we've recommended a few times and implemented that is um, also an interesting disruption to the industry. Um, they are entirely cloud-based on the Acumatica side of things, and they do really, really well with uh, products that are high margin, low volume, because um, their pricing model is different. It's um, Their disruption to the industry is we don't pay based on user licenses. We pay, You pay based on transactional volume, um, which is an interesting, and it, it does make sense to me uh, you know, from a certain perspective to charge for how many how many bytes go through the pipe, right? Um, and that's where, where Acumatica plays really well. I've seen them out, um, out-compete fun- folks from a functionality perspective, um, but lose because they're just, that volume becomes the, the, a price-sensitive conversation where if you're high volume, low margin, it's just difficult to support an Acumatic type of system. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. That That is actually something I was going to ask is, Acumatica is another one that was in our top 10 list, our most recommended uh, systems list. Um, let me get to some audience questions before we um, wrap, wrap up here. I, I have to share this comment, um, partly to keep my own ego in check. Uh, this, so- this is from Allie. <laughs> this is from Allie on YouTube, <laughs> who says, you make our life miserable. Our university <laughs> instructor assigns us to watch some of your videos and quiz. I, I think he means uh, quizzed, uh, quizzes us. I would say you're welcome, but it sounds like that's not a good thing in your, your opinion. But I hope you do learn something from this and other videos that, that you watch. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if there's something that doesn't make sense on the on the YouTube channel that you don't like, I, I love feedback. So uh, any any feedback you share is, is good stuff. Um, and then uh, Gassan on LinkedIn, uh, continuing with the sun, berm, uh, the sun theme, which kind of fits the third stage rocket theme. And, uh, again, just more brilliant ideas for our marketing team. Um, we, we had an eclipse today, but I didn't notice any changes in my shadow intensity. So uh, I'm, I'm having trouble drawing a connection there with the anal- taking that analogy to where, where he's going there, but I just uh, thought I'd share that comment there. Um, what about um, another, one other system I wanted to ask you about, Adam, is um, DCOM. That's one that yeah. – that was just outside. It was either just outside or at the lower side of our our top ten most recommended systems. But it is one that sort of like IFS, uh, interesting for some, as, as Gassan said, which I think is actually <laughs> it's actually a good analogy, even though he's, I think he's being funny. 
Um, but I think it kind of it makes sense because IFS isn't a great fit for a lot of people. But it, where, where it is a good fit, it's a really good fit. And they, they tend to be very focused. Yeah. And DCOM is another one that, that strikes me as a pretty focused vendor. What are, you, what are your thoughts on DCOM? Um, yeah, very focused for sure. Um, DCOM, is, uh, I think what will be fo- most interesting about DCOM is to see what happens within the next three or five years. Because um, founded by a gentleman who grew it as a family business, uh, grew it himself and, and built it up. And it's a very, very good package for things like agriculture and, um, and process manufacturing, particularly. Um, that's where we see it compete the strongest because process manufacturing is just a different animal when you start talking about things like units of measure and uh, things like food and beverage. Um, it does kind of get outpaced when the business gets large. So um, DCOM has, um, I've seen them struggle to, to fit for larger uh, software companies um, that, that start to graduate into the more upper tier two, tier one space. Um, but they're definitely a consideration. They got strong functionality and a, a great backing. Uh, but they were recently acquired, and I would um, I would say that just like any business that is homegrown and by by a founder that was his entire vision, and having somebody else buy that, um, you start to wonder what the roadmap and the vision, how the, how do those change, and what could that look like? Because at the end of the day. The functionality is there um, and it's, it's definitely a strong model and you get really a, a good um, a good relationship from DCOM. Um, but I'll, I'll be interested to see how they turn out um, now that they've been acquired because that can, can be a pretty dramatic change for a company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially when they've had such a distinct niche and a distinct focus, you wonder, will they yeah. preserve that focus? And you kind of get into the whole vendor viability discussion too. That's something you have to think mm-hmm. about as you consider software solutions, you're not just buying a solution, you're buying into a vendor, their long-term roadmap, their R&D, the strengths and weaknesses of all that. So I think that's a, an important point you bring up is you want to, you can't predict the future with 100% certainty, but all things being equal, you might look at the vendor roadmap as sort of a, the vendor viability and roadmap as a, as a sort of a tiebreaker if you need to. Mm-hmm. What is, um, and you can kind of read into that because I like the idea of comparing the, um, the acquisitional models of uh, we've, we've talked about a couple of them. You have SAP um, that's gobbling up smaller packages. You have um, the private equity firm that bought IFS and Acumatica. Um, you have the Coke acquisition of N4. Uh, you have the uh, the DCOM acquisition there, and that all comes together for me to start thinking about what's going on here. Uh, we've seen the Coke acquisition do great things for M4, but it's been, it, it takes time for a company like that to impart its wisdom on the rest of the organization. Um, I would say that the, um, I think it's EQT partners or something like that, that bought um, IFS and Acumatica. The fact that they bought them both so close together leads me to think that this is a private equity firm that isn't just interested in, in uh, fix and flip right? They're looking to corner a market and they're looking to cash in on it. Um, the decom side of things is difficult to shake out a little bit more. Um, that seems like it could be more in the fix and flip scenario be, just because of the nature of, uh, um, of what decom does and how it is, it fits into the industry. So all of those things are, are good comparisons to thinking about what it is that means for your product long-term, right? SAP obviously committed to its own software package. Coke obviously committed to the, the software um, as well. They're pouring a lot, a lot into that. Um, same with the, the, the firm that bought IFS and, and Acumatica. Uh, DCOM, I would, I, would, I would certainly ask the questions, what does it look like if, um, if I buy your software and you decide to flip this company in the middle of my implementation? Yeah, yeah. There's some very, very important points because you do have to think longer term about implementation, support, ongoing maintenance, all that good stuff. Um, so I guess just to summarize, we're, we're, we could spend another hour or two or three on this topic. So we'll, we'll uh, in the interest of time, wrap it up here. But just as a sort of a concluding thought, you know, what if 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 I'm an organization that is trying to figure out which, which of these systems are best for me, obviously I can't, I don't have the time and resources to go do a deep dive into all these different systems we've talked about. Um but how do I get started? You know, what are some sort of takeaways you could leave with with project teams that are about to go through 
an evaluation process? What are some of the quick hit sorts of things you can recommend to get us started? Yeah, if we're talking about looking at what we've got here, um, I would say first, understand what space you fit in, right? Um, are you a small company that's just graduating off of QuickBooks? Um, and what does that mean to you? Um, cause if, if that's the case, you may end up in a more niche based three tier three product that could fit your needs very well. Um, if you're a tier two, there's, you know, there's a certain set of, uh, software packages to fit there. And if you're a tier one, you're looking at Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, um, with some considerations as to whether or not M4 can, can, can accommodate you or IFS can as well. Those I would I think about it that way. Know what size you fit fits you best, and then start with that. From there, um, start thinking about the the requirements. That's really the key. Um, you know, once you know which space you fit, um, what size you're gonna wear here, um, start figuring out what your requirements are and, and what makes you unique and complex. Yeah, and really focusing on those differentiating requirements and it's you know maybe your top 10 20 percent of your requirements that you really hone in on and use that as the big differentiation yep. evaluation factor for sure okay thanks adam and thanks for the great participation and questions from the audience uh, on that topic uh there's a lot more we have to unpack from that conversation but first we'll take a quick break you're listening to transformation ground control If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 92. I'm Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. Tyler, we just had Adam on the show. We were talking about uh, leading ERP systems in the market. What was what was some of your uh, feedback or takeaways from that discussion? Oh, absolutely. Well, those are always great because we we have such a great vendor network and partner network that it's always great to have that interaction. Um, so I highly recommend if you missed it, we do still check those comments. So you can head over to any of the social platforms that Eric and Adam were having the conversation on and, and definitely join and let us know what what your thoughts are on that. Um, I th I think the how how you started and kind of talking through um, how you guys evaluate this. I think it's important to understand that um, this evaluation, obviously, we talk about is fully independent. But can you talk a little bit about how you you guys choose these top softwares too, and when kind of when it goes into that methodology? Sure. So the top 10 list I was referring to today when we were having that discussion was our um, actually a list that Adam helped compile, which was the list of recent evaluations and selections that we'd made for clients. And so it was looking at you know just the frequency of how often did we recommend one solution over the other. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're the best solutions in the market, but it's a, it's a place to start. And that's why we, we started from that point. We also do our top 10 rankings that looks at overall cost, the risk, the implementation complexity, the potential upside and ROI, the functionality, long-term vendor roadmap, a lot of uh, quantitative and qualitative factors. And that's where uh, if you go to download our, our digital transformation report that I was mentioning in the segment, if you download that report, which you can find in the link to this podcast episode, you'll see the, all the different top 10 rankings that we've done for different industry verticals, different situational types of things. And the whole idea here is that depending on what your priorities are, you're going to end up with a different top 10 list, depending on what industry you're in, what goals you're trying to accomplish, what functional areas you're trying to address, or which functional areas are the biggest pain points for your organization. All that is going to lead to a different top 10 list than others. And so I think that's part of what we wanted to try to scratch the surface on with Adam was just what are the pros and cons? Where do certain 
um, software solutions make sense and where don't they make sense? And so as that's, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's generally how we, how we do those rankings. Absolutely. And I think another important point, just from an understanding um, segue is that these businesses are of all different sizes that we work with in all different industries. So we don't have a specialty. Our specialty is helping to advise on the best technology for the business that that we're um, we're tasked with evaluating. Uh, so that's that's a really cool just overall aspect of third stage on the content development side is there are some for manufacturing, there are some um, for small business, all those different types of of opportunities. So. I wanted to kind of build on, you touched on low code, no code, kind of Odoo type of software. And a lot of times we see kind of this emergence in the industry of these new kind of disruptors and new players, but not might not be to the complexity level that could be, uh, you know, an SAP S4 HANA or a larger kind of global ERP conglomerate. So what would you say to you, a bigger organization that was considering a more module-based or low-code, no-code-based system in the evaluation process to ensure that it really is the right fit? Well, it's it's sort of like you have to uh, reverse course a bit on the desire to potentially roll out just one module or one piece of software and look at bigger picture, what are the enterprise-wide needs of the organization, even if it's going to take you years to deploy or you're not going to deploy it right away, at least you know that you're getting into a software solution that can meet long-term needs outside of the immediate needs. And so I think the risk or the challenge with some of the more flexible solutions in the market, like, you know, Odoo is one with open source, low code, no code, uh, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, Adam and I talk quite a bit about, you know, the flexibility of Dynamics and the platform that they've created that allows for customization of software for better, for worse. You know, some of that innovation, and I know we talked about this earlier in the show about can you over innovate, sometimes technology innovation actually creates unintentional problems. And that problem is that now we've created an incentive or an opportunity to just go attack one specific problem within our organization and automate it or improve it without necessarily thinking about the bigger picture. And that's how a lot of organizations get into trouble long term is that they end up with multiple systems, they end up with a hodgepodge or a the spaghetti bowl diagram of different systems. And then they come to us and say, Hey, third stage, we need your help now. Cause we've got all these different systems that don't talk to one another. It's disparate. We want a single enterprise wide solution. So it's sort of like a pendulum that swings, you know, on one hand, you want the low risk immediate value, but on the other hand, you have to think longer term. And it just depends on where you are in the journey, I suppose, as far as what's more important. If you're trying to attack, you know, your human capital management, your HR department really needs new technology to make for a better employee experience. That's your number one priority. Then sure, go find an HCM system. They can do that. But what's even better is if you can find an HCM system that does what you need it or want it to do, but it also um, addresses some of your other enterprise wide needs longer term as well. Yeah, definitely. And those integrations and overall maintenance pieces we know are so important with those those different systems um, as well, just in the in the consideration process. So I thought I might give you like because I know you really like to be boxed in with the, these recommendations. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I might give you three different industries, and you would give me your top three systems that you would evaluate, not choose, but would consider. So you can still have your it depends in there. Okay. Okay. So you, got you it. can as long as you give me that three. out. That's all yeah, that matters. Right. <laughs> So if I were a mid-size manufacturing organization, heavy manufacturing, heavy supply chain, what three systems would you choose? Um, I'm probably going to look at Epicor. I would probably look at Infor because they, they have a pretty solid uh, supply chain solution within the cloud suite of products. Um, and I would choose uh, Epicor, by the way, it would be especially important if it's a make to order or engineer to order type of um, company, then I'd, I'd for sure include Epicor. Um, and then I might have, um, if since I'm mid-size, mid-market, I might look at Oracle Cloud ERP, probably wouldn't look at SAP S4 HANA, um, probably wouldn't look at Microsoft Dynamics because manufacturing is generally not as strength if I had a lot of complexity, especially. If I was a pretty vanilla manufacturer, I might consider Microsoft D365 instead. Um, so I'd say just from what limited information you gave me, I'd say Infor, Epicor, and uh, 
uh, Oracle ERP cloud or cloud ERP. Okay. Okay. And what if I was a small to mid tier e-commerce focused retail business? Uh, I'd probably look at uh, Odoo um, because they've got a pretty solid e-commerce and point of sale and it's built for smaller, some smaller mid-market companies. Um, Epicor has a product and I am drawing a blank on it. Um, it's not, it, Epicor has their kinetic product, which is sort of their flagship, you know, main solution, but they also have a retail solution. I, um, and I, I apologize, I'm drawing a blank, but Epicor has a, has a retail solution that is used by some larger organizations, but a lot of small mid-market companies. Um, and then I suppose, gosh, there's so many options here. I might look at uh, a dynamics, maybe. Um, that might be overkill, if I, especially if I look at the, depending on which dynamics I'm talking about. If I'm talking about dynamics has two options, you have the uh, FNO, which is sort of for the bigger organizations. And then you have business central, which is for smaller mid-sized organizations. I might look at business central uh, for a small mid-market e-commerce, but I say, if you're an e-commerce retailer, there are a lot of options, uh, yeah. especially if you're in the small and mid-market. So I, you could easily, I could easily make a case for three or five or 10 others that should be in that short list instead. But those are the, those are the first ones that come to mind. Right. Right. Definitely. Um, I thought you were going to say NetSuite on that one for sure, but. Yeah. Next, actually that, now that you say it, um, uh, NetSuite probably shouldn't be on there. Cause that is something they do pretty well. Although, um, the flexibility of NetSuite is a little suspect at times. So, uh, that would be my only hesitation, but you, we do, we have seen a lot of retail and distribution companies that are not manufacturing. If they have manufacturing, NetSuite's oftentimes not a good fit, but if you're just doing pure distribution and retail point of sale e-commerce, then yeah, NetSuite, NetSuite's actually a really solid option. Okay. And then last one, I promise I'll, I'll stop making you uncomfortable, but say I am a, a global, very large, complex organization that focuses in food and beverage suppliers. Food and beverage. So, um, uh, let's see. So it, how, how big of a company is this? It's global. So it, it's similar to companies we've worked with before, very large very, um, you know, multi, multi, uh, country ran manufacturing plants in many different areas. Um, you probably know who I'm talking about at this point, but, um, what would you recommend in knowing that there's lots of food and beverage specialties, but also being a, a global, um, conglomerate of that size is mm -hmm. very difficult with yeah. smaller, more specialized systems. Yeah. So since it's a bigger one, I, I think SAP S4 HANA is when you'd want to consider, they do have a lot of uh, clients in the food and beverage space. Um, I'd probably also look at in four as sort of a, it might be a good counterbalance to SAP. It, it probably going to be a lower cost, lower risk, but potentially lower benefit longer term sort of solution, but that might be a better, you know, right size for your risk profile. Um, and then on top of that, I might also look at um, within the Microsoft Dynamics space, uh, there are ISVs that uh, provide scalable D365 based solutions for food and beverage. One that comes to mind is Just Food, um, which they were just bought by someone. I, I'm drawing a blank. Another big vendor bought Just Food. But Just Food is a food and bev company that built a food and beverage solution on the Microsoft Dynamics platform. So that might be another one I'd consider. Uh, if I were in that space or that situation. Well, very good. Well, thanks for playing my on the spot game. Um, <laughs> but I think the the bigger piece of that is understanding the needs of the organization, like you and um, you and Adam had mentioned. Uh, but there's lots of options out there. And, you know, again, for my shameless plug is um, engaging an expert. It sounds like is really the first step in going through a software evaluation just because to what I was trying to prove there from my marketing Jedi mind tricks is there is a lot of, of vendors just in specific industries, business size, um, overall functional needs, having that ability to have someone that understands that. Um, just from a, an evaluation standpoint, we didn't even go into contract negotiations, implementation, you know, yeah. vendor management, project management, which is arguably harder, right, than, um, than selecting the software. So 
having that relationship up front is just so important. And obviously we're passionate about doing that here at third stage, which is why we had Adam on the show to showcase kind of all of the the different um, ways in which we evaluate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, something that you could do right away that doesn't take much time or effort is to download our 2023 digital transformation report, a lot of different independent reviews and rankings in that report uh, for different types of industries and um, that sort of thing. So be sure to check that out. Uh, The link is below for wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast, just go to the description and you'll find the link for the 2023 digital transformation report. So we're going to shift gears and, you know, once you've selected software, it's, you've got to figure out how to implement it. How do you get people to adjust and and, uh, adapt to the change? And so we want to talk about change management in this last segment. We're going to bring uh, Donia and Nate from the third stage team onto the show. Um, Nate's been on the show before. I don't believe Donia has, Um, but she's been uh, part of our digital stratosphere events. Um, She's based out of uh, South Africa and Nate's based out of the U.S. And they recently gave a presentation about uh, change management deliverables and what some of those deliverables should look like. And and it's a really good discussion because it gives more uh, tangibility, if that's a word. Mm -hmm. If not, I just made it up. It's more tangibility to the change management. Yeah. I mean, it sounds legitimate. I mean, it's got to be a real world. It's a word now. (laughs) We're creating it. We're saving the world. We're addressing digital transformation. We're creating new words. I mean, we do so much on the show. We really do. Um, But yet students hate my content according to (laughs) I forgot to to mention that I hope everyone heard that because I died laughing when that happened and the funny part is tonight I have a a lecture um at a university and I can't wait to tell them all about how I'm going to make them miserable because their (laughs) their teacher's gonna ask them questions that's so funny (laughs) I know and if you missed that uh, part of the interview there was a student that said I, I make his life miserable because his professor makes me or makes them watch my videos all the time. So I, I didn't know whether to laugh or feel bad or to feel great, you know, feel glad that he gets to learn. But anyway, um, so I digress. I have no idea how I got on. Now I totally lost track of how I got on that. That's, time. But, <laughs> that's okay. We're just here to educate uh, to whether it makes you miserable or happy. We hope you are on the happy scale, but yeah, yeah. The, the, the change management conversation is definitely an important one. The deliverable focus. Yeah, absolutely. That's thank you for getting me back on track there. Yeah, so that is what we're going to talk about next is change management deliverables, um, making it tangible. That's how it started. Tangibility of, uh, of change management. So we're going to get to that here in a moment. But first, we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Transformation Ground Control episode number 92. My name is Eric Kimberly here with Kyla Cheatham. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on wherever you're listening or watching now. Um, I'm excited for our next guest or the next clip, actually, we're going to play for you. It's a, a presentation that was recently given at our online digital stratosphere event, which, by the way, you can go watch the entire event, all the different sessions and workshops we hosted. Go to stratosphere2022.com. And you can find this as well as several other uh, presentations that were given at this event. Stratosphere2022.com is where you can find this. But we want to cherry pick this one keynote or this one presentation that Donia and Nate from the third stage team gave. And they talk about change management deliverables, which is a great discussion because I think one of the misunderstandings with change management is is that it's something that feels good. It's really touchy-feely. And there's a negative perception oftentimes that there's not any tangible value 
to change management activities. And so we want to counter that and we want to give some substance and tangibility, uh, continuing with that uh, made up word that I, I think I created. Uh, we're going to add some tangibility to uh, change management deliverables uh, here in this discussion. So let's roll the clip with Donia and Nate talking about change management deliverables. My name is Donia and I'm really excited to be here today because this is our first digital stratosphere for the EMEA region for third stage consulting. I'm here today in the capacity of the change management and learning enablement lead for third stage consulting for this region. I've done transformation projects across the world in multiple industries, most recently in the HR space, which is quite of interest. But of course, I also have banking, insurance, telecommunications, and IT experience. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, who is our practice lead in Colorado. He's the practice lead for change management for the US region. And I'm going to hand over to Nate to introduce himself. Thanks, Danya. Um, hi, this is Nate Strahr with Third Stage Consulting, and <clears throat> I've uh, spent most of my career over 20 years in digital transformation, software selection, and change management. And really excited to talk to you today about some of our change management projects that we've been engaged in in the last year. We've seen a huge uptick in, in clients requesting change management services and have really seen not only uh, a huge uptick in the desire to have these change management uh, initiatives, but also in the size that we are seeing from our clients, anywhere from clients all the way to 30 person organizations. So we're really excited today to talk to you about these change management deliverables, which are the same no matter what the size of the client. I wanna give you some examples of the um, not only the deliverables, but yeah, some examples of what we've seen with our clients and some of the trends that we've seen throughout the last year on some of our projects. So I'll turn it back over to you, Danya, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. And I just want to really also reach out to the audience to say, you know, we want we would like to know what kind of deliverables you do as well. And just share with us, give us some feedback about what we're saying. We want to make it interactive. And uh, I did mention it in our earlier session. I'm just going to say it again that we specifically selected this topic because we believe there's a, there's been requests for it. And I've also heard it when we go present to clients, when we meet with clients, they say, what exactly do you do for change management? What are the deliverables? And sometimes it's really good to go to the foundation, to the core of the this offering and share it with you. We're going to keep it simple. We're going to look at three elements. We're going to look at what the deliverable actually is, why we do it, and how it's done. Yeah. Sharing of some stories, some case studies, some examples along the way. So I know we've only got probably now like 40 minutes. So <laughs> let's get right into it. As I said, we're focusing on five key deliverables today. The organizational ready assessment, readiness assessment, the communications plan, change impact plan, training plan, and very important KPIs and metrics. Let's start with the organizational readiness assessment. This is a document. So if we look at what it is, it's a document that gets delivered, but this is like... I want to say the, the meat of everything, the, it, it encapsulates the vision of what this is, what change is going to happen. So it's got some key elements such as uh, the vision statement that comes out of the stakeholder assessment, uh, st stakeholder workshops that Nate will be taking you through. It looks at why this the change is being done. So as I mentioned, what change is being done? why the change is being done, who are some of the key high-level stakeholders, what are some of the challenges and risks that we foresee, what are the strengths that we know up, up front, what are the critical success factors, how are we going to measure the success, and what support do we need. For example, very critically, you might need specific leadership support, or if you are part of a bigger group, you might be one of the subsidiaries or a smaller unit and you need support from group as well. Uh, what this also contains is the approach to change management and 
which team players are you looking at including? When I look at the why, I don't usually do this, but I'd really like just to read the statement here because I really think it explains it very well. It is to provide and agree upon a clear understanding throughout the organization of where we stand now, where we are heading, how ready we are to get there, and who and what needs to happen to increase the odds of success. So this is really about establishing a common understanding amongst everybody that it's involved, especially the, the team players, the people that are involved in the development and the execution and involved in making the change a success. Also, the outputs from uh, the readiness document will be used in the further uh, documentation or assessments that we will discuss with you down the line. I will pro probably want to come back and share one or two stories, but I will hand over to Nate to speak about the how this is done first. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, you know, I think just to to reiterate, uh, and then we'll jump into the how. But this is really this the organizational readiness assessment is really sort of the kickoff. This is really um, to to sit down and to, to look at an organization and say, um, here's where you want to be, here's where you are, here's where you want to be, and here's how the technology will support you to get. We when when we do when we create these deliverables and when we go through this phase of a change management initiative, it's really sitting down and it's meeting with the organization, starting with the executives, really sitting down and saying, where are you now? Now, where do you want to be in a year and three years from now? Technology gets you, help you to get to where you want to be, and what do you want to get out of this initiative? It's really sitting down and saying, okay, what do you consider success? What do you consider um, coming out of this, this initiative? What do you consider the main things that are needed to get you to where you want to be? We spend time in workshops with both the end users, the executives, uh, we also conduct surveys um, and really try and get a feel for how ready the organization is. Uh, are, is, it a, is it an organization that's very tech savvy? Is, is the change going more of a change in how they do business or is it going to be a monumental change? Is it they're going to be a paradigm shift? Are, are we going for, I think I heard one of our clients uh, mention the other day, they said, you know, we're going literally from the equivalent of a rotary phone to a smartphone. We are so behind in our technology and what we're going um, and what we're implementing here and where we're going is a monumental leap. That that gives us an idea of how much we have, how much change the organization is going to see. So the, the basically the how and the why and what, what we get out of this or of this deliverable is to really, here's where you are, here's where you wanna be, Here's how ready you are for this change. And these are the areas that we need to focus on the most to successfully implement this change. Yeah, and I wonder if we might be able to, to look at this question. I think it's a great one. Um, and I actually have no idea what the answer is um, from a, a user on LinkedIn. Um, so they asked what percent of transformation programs prepare an organizational readiness document? And I'll answer first and say, not enough. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and I, I think I th this is a great question. And, um, you know, I, I think it's it's really uh, it, I guess it, it really, uh, you know, kind of give you that on the fence answer. But um, I would say that not enough and it's probably not taken into enough detail. It's not given enough emphasis and it's not really sat down and formalized. And I, I, I'll go with a, with a great example and it always starts with the executive visioning session. We, um, when we kick up these change management initiatives, we sit and we say, where, where is it that you are and where is it that you wanna be? Without a doubt, every time we go into these sessions, the executives will say, we know where we are. We know where we wanna be. We're all in alignment. And then you send out a, um questionnaire ahead of time saying what what will the technology give you where do you want to be and where are you going to go if you send out 10 you're likely to get eight different answers out of the 10 so i i would say that 
while people a lot of times finish this step, they um, they they prepare an org readiness document. It's really not just preparing the document, but it's going through the exercise. It's really sitting down and saying, "Fine, let's make sure that even though we all think we're aligned, let's make sure that we're all going to discuss this and really come to an alignment as an executive team." And then take that vision and, and spread that vision throughout the organization so that everyone really knows here's where we're going, here's what the change is gonna involve, and here's how we're gonna get there. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. I just wanted to add to that, specifically picking up where you say, you know, sometimes it is done, but what I have seen is about the thoroughness and the effectiveness of it. So sometimes these sections such as the vision or, you know, I have seen something called a, a vision document or, um, you know, that picks or some slides, I wanted to say, like a couple of slides that highlights the vision. But I've also seen the, the real thorough details uh, behind the scenes that can happen. So real thorough list of questions. So what is the scope of this? Who will be impacted? What is the level of change per area? What is the perception of the change per area? How will you meet, you know, success? How will you get to the benefits? So as my colleagues have said, <laughs> it's probably not done enough and, and more often not done thoroughly enough. Thanks for that great question. I'll let you keep going on the presentation and then we'll pull up a few more of these questions. Um, we'd love to know just for the audience where you're joining us from today. I know a few of you are already kind of used to uh, that question and already answering it from our live streams, but it looks like we have some users from Botswana. We've got um, some from India and then Iran as well. So all all great global audience. Um, so pop those questions in the chat and um, we'll have Donia and Nate address them. All right, thank you so much, Carla. Can you see my screen? We can, yes. Okay, great. So we'll move on. So coming out of this, the vision document, if it is done properly and thoroughly, very likely you will get an idea of the communication, the key messages, and, and basically the gaps in the understanding and what are the key messages to keep everybody engaged and to distribute the communication, to distribute the information. What is very key to highlight about the communication plan is that it should have the foresight of not just looking at the communication for the current engagement, but the ongoing communication post go live. Um, I'm sure many of you that have been involved in a change, either from the the in the user side, like from the front end or the back, that you know some you'll see something goes live, and there's a communication to say congrats, we're live, and then <laughs> it's kind of silent. You don't know how the project, how the change is progressing, how effective it is. So I really want to highlight that it's important to think of what you're going to do post go live until you've reached the stability that you set out to upfront. Another very important uh, element to highlight in what we do with the comms plan is that it's not a one size fits all. It's not just one emailer or one newsletter that goes out. Deep thought and consideration needs to be given to the different uh, areas, the different stakeholders, the type of roles. It could even be based on geographies that might require different type of information. And that there's multiple way of ways of disseminating that information as well, different mechanisms to use. Um, and the, the communication plan is really to build the initial understanding of the project, but it will evolve. So those messages continuously need to be revisited as you're progressing through the transformation initiative. So that's a bit about what the deliverable is. Why it's done is really, as I said up front, to have an effective way to get everybody engaged and to have the correct information sent out to ensure that there's alignment and understanding. I will hand over to Nate here because I can go on and on. So <laughs> Nate, over to you to discuss a bit more on the how we do it. 
Okay, this is uh, great. And and we're actually this is a this is a great time to be presenting this because um, we're working with a client this week on their communications plan. So we have a lot of real relevant examples that we we've, we've been working on this week. But patient plan when we talk about the how, it's it's first of all talking about the audience. Um, who who is the audience that you hope to reach, and and how what is their um, what is the key message that you want to communicate? And throughout the or throughout the initiative, the, the communication is going to be different. It's going to be different before you start the project, during the project, go live and post go live. So we want to first of all say who's the audience, who are we trying to reach? What are we going to be communicating throughout the different phases of the project? And then really what channels that we're going to use. We, we have a lot of manufacturing clients. A lot of um, the employees at our clients are on the shop floor, so they're, they're not using a lot of email. They're a lot more interactive face-to-face -face communications. That's gonna be different than the executive suite who's gonna be each other most often through email, through Zoom calls, and through conference calls. So you really wanna sit down and say, how are we going to communicate to these individuals? And again, how is that going to change throughout the project? As as we're working on um, on these different change phases, say, you know how how it how has it been done in the past? How are we going to do it? And then really sit down and say what what do we need to change? What do we need to put in place um, to to get the communication out there? Um, this is this is often uh, you know for companies again uh, kind of going back to a, a point we made earlier for organizations that um, have a good communication plan in place this is really just sitting down and more formalizing how we're going to do this throughout this change initiative so this out of all the deliverables is one of those that it's really not only creating this plan but it's really confirming hey, how are you going to change and putting a lot of detail around just exactly what this plan looks like we're here with donia and nate talking about change management deliverables we've got a lot more to cover but first we'll take a quick break you're listening to transformation ground control the to wonder, to wonder. if you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit Third thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. We're here with Donia and Nate who are presenting a keynote presentation about change management deliverables. Let's jump right back into it. So this is a great one um, from Gassan. Again, he's on our CIO panel, so feel free to um, join us later this afternoon. Uh, great insight from him always. But what if a readiness document says that a lot of work needs to happen before jumping into a digital transformation project? How long can a client wait? And what if they refuse to do all the prerequisites? Well, you know, I think I think this is this is a great question, and um, we're gonna we're gonna hit a little bit on this later on in our presentation. But um, you know, it's it's never there's I would say that that with all of this, it's it's never too late to start. Um, and when you say how long can a client wait, well, I think the key is that it, it's really important to get started. So if you don't have um, if, if they refuse to do all the prerequisites if they don't have the if they don't have the time or they don't see the importance it's still important to get something started so when when we talk about this readiness document um, <clears throat> while we might not um, be putting a lot of formality around it I think that the key is that it's it's something that you just need to jump into so you no know, really I, I I like to refer to it as if you don't know what your starting point is and if you skip this step, 
how do you know what you need to do to get to where you're going? If you don't know where you are now, you're never going to be able to, to, to know what the steps are to get you to where you want to go just because you don't know where you are. Absolutely. And then um, I'll bring up this one too, and maybe we'll start with you, Donia, on, on this piece of it and, <laughs> and get your insight. I know you your guys are chomping at the bit to talk, all our OCMs are, and I feel that way too. Um, but do you ever find do you ever find a challenge to get the right timing in the communication plans? Too early people ignore it as irrelevant, but gives but needs to give the audience enough warning of what's coming and how they're going to be impacted. So can you speak to that a little bit, Donia? Yes, I can. Thank you, Kyla. Um, you know, doing all of this in reality is challenging because the world is obviously moving fast. There's a lot of um, risks that might come up. So of course there are challenges that come up and, so, you know, sometimes there's a feel that the timing is never right. But the important thing is that regardless of the challenges, it needs to be done. You know, you might not, if you keep on waiting and saying the time is not right, nothing will go out. So, if, Carla, if you can please just pull up the, the rest of the question as well. I know I'm tackling the first part of it. So, my answer to that is even if there are challenges, it is very important to get the communication out there. And uh, just to highlight that we spoke about multiple challenge, uh, multiple channels. And you're right. Some people don't have time to read an email or an email is not the best way, for example, for some people. So try and be consistent with the messaging. Get it out there. Uh, uh, for example, I can I'll just give you something really practical is if you have all of the leadership aligned, a simple thing is to request that in all the team meetings, you know, they just update all the employees in the area about what's happening, where we are, and some of the key challenges. It could literally be as simple as that uh, to tackle the challenges of the timing and holding off because of risks. I hope I answered the question correct, uh, that the question that was asked. Unfortunately, I cannot see the questions while they are, while I'm screen sharing. <laughs> so I, if I've missed anything, please let me know, Kyla. No worries. We have some great questions coming in, but let's keep going on um, your your hows um, here, and then we'll we'll jump back in. So keep popping those in the chat. We're watching them. Thank you so much, Kyla, and thank you everybody for your engagement. Uh, we're going to next talk about the change impact plan. And uh, when we started off, we said the change readiness is really the meat. It has all the information. And um, between Nate and I, we agreed that change impact plan is, is probably the heart of everything because this is where you really start to get into the details of the change impact that's happening. And what's very important to highlight here is that this is all the types of change you bring in if there's going to be a process change or a role change. It's not just the items relating to the technology and really go through every change one by one, looking at the degree of impact of the change, which groups it's going to affect, uh, what's the perception of the change by those, those groups, and then coming out of that is what are the action plans that are going to be put into place. And those actions can feed into your change management plan or back into your communications plan, and, and then you can also create a heat map where you look at what are the top changes and what are the top priorities. Um, I just want to make sure I've told you everything here. So, and, and what some people ask about a stakeholder assessment, often in the work we do, we include the stakeholder assessment as part of the change impact. And as I said, mapping out what changes are affecting which groups. So this is really done to be able to track the details of the changes and to know uh, which groups it's going to impact, which geographies it's going to impact, and to know what the types of changes are and that they are all being tackled. Nate, over to you to talk a bit on the how this is all done. 
Yeah, so this and this is really, again, kind of the, the meat of it. And this is really kind of the most challenging part of most of the change impact initiatives that we undertake. And this is really when we sit down with this is spending a lot of time with the executives and the end users to sit down and, and not so much focus on what their job is today. That's very important to say, how are you doing it today? But how are you doing it today? How are you going to be doing um, how are you going to be conducting business in the future and what that change is? Um, it's really sitting down and um, and finding out, uh, you know, what are uh, tracking all the changes. So that it's, sometimes it's as little as we're going to be calling fields different names. We're going to be uh, tracking things differently all the way through to um, the new technology will change the way our organization is struck. People are doing their jobs. The different work streams will be div divvying the work up differently. So it's really sitting down and saying, um, you know, what are those challenges? What are the what what are we um, you know what are what are the big ones? What are the small ones? Keeping track of all of them and um, really so while everything's important, let's focus on the top change impacts. Let's address those and let's really make sure that we have a good assessment of what are our opportunities, what are our challenges, what are our strengths, and what are our weaknesses. Do, are we ready for this change? Is your impact? Do we need to train differently? Do we need to put different skill sets into our employees? Or is this something that it's just gonna be, you know, I turn on a screen tomorrow morning, it looks a little bit different, I call things a little bit different in, within the system, and it's really not going to be much of a change. So it's, it's sitting down and just getting a really clear assessment on where we are, where we're gonna be, and how ready we are for the impact that's going to happen with the new initiative. Excellent stuff, guys. We obviously have more questions. So, so I'm going to read this one. It's um, from one of our viewers on YouTube. So thank you so much for watching. Sometimes the, man the management requires plans with timelines when actual readiness is not yet established. How can you tackle this situation and convince management to focus on the readiness first? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I I think it's um, you know I think it's just probably the best way that I would answer that is just to sit down and really clearly lay out what what the what the initiative is, have a good plan, and show the importance of, of each one of the steps. I know that that's a little bit of a a high level answer and I'm not sure if I'm answering the question correctly, but I think it's it's really just sitting down and saying, you know, here's our comprehensive plan for the entire initiative, um, laying it out and, and talking through the importance of due to get through this initiative. Yeah. And and Nate, if I could add to that, uh, something to that, that, you know, we, we almost want to say it's never too late. So what I've seen happen in this scenario is often at one point you'll see the negative impact of not having done the readiness perhaps you know the changes already if you have several releases you might see that already after one release there's no response it's not there's no adoption so it's very important that even if you haven't done the readiness up front to still go back pause and look and use that to go back to leaders and say well, we need to do it differently this time. Often, unfortunately, it's learning through mistakes in this case. And um, but I'm just reading the question on my other screen here. Um, when readiness, what you can, what I think is also important, just that first part is about um, when how to tackle it when readiness is not yet established, is if you as an individual are aware of potential challenges or potential pitfalls that you really believe this is not going to work this change is not going to be effective if we don't address you know have the courage and, and be direct to go and, and actually show what those pitfalls are or what those challenges are instead of just you know saying let's do a readiness sometimes leaders really need to see the practical outcomes i hope that helps
Yeah, I think so. And and I'll just add, even though I'm not on the panel, but, um, you know, I just like to share my opinion. You guys know that. Um, but so I, I think it's one thing is to bring in the experts because a lot of times mm -hmm. that internal trust isn't always established, which is not a bad thing, but bringing in data uh, around external um, change management consultants or change management experts to show your executive team or your management team, like this is our experience, this is the data around what we see as far as failures if you don't establish that readiness. So just, you know, a little color for you there. Um, but thank you for the questions. I know you have more here in the chat and we'll we'll get to them as well, but I'll hand it back over to you, um, Donia and Nate. Thank you. Thank you, Kyla. All right. So next up is our the training plan. And as with the communication plan, this is a comprehensive plan of the training support that's required. And very importantly, as mentioned with the comms plan, it should look at the training that's required during the implementation, but also ongoing training that's going to be required. And that will be assessed. Actually, our next topic is metrics and KPIs, but it's important to realize that you'll need some kind of feedback mechanism in order to understand the training gaps even after going live. <laughs> so again, it's not like, let's train everybody, send out user manuals, the initiative has gone live, and then you think that training is done. So please remember that when you're looking at a training plan. And as with the, the comms plan, it looks at the different stakeholder groups. So often when I've done this previously, I would look at the stakeholder groupings that were addressed in the communications plan that could potentially be a match. Or I can give you another example where I was part of a workday rollout for a large organization and the training was tailored um, against the key user groups. In this case, it was like the HR community, the management team, and then the employees. So we just had three groupings in that case. And very, very important is to look at the methods of training. Really, it's not just screenshots, you know, or a manual. There's a lot of different me methods that can be used as well as different resources. So you might consider, for example, having internal trainers, which case they would need to be trained. So in that scenario, you would do train the training, train the trainers, <laughs> Or um, alternatively on this Workday project, for example, we had videos, we had online FAQ, we had online forums. And something that I think was very successful was we, we used the change champions to actually be super users. And so in every area, there was a super user and people could literally go to a person and, and ask them, how do I do this? And that's also kind of part of the training. Um, that was before COVID, so we were all in an office and you could go to one person, but of course you could still have a super user as in an expert, you know, in, in, even in the virtual space. And those are really some of the key messages around what the training plan is and why it's done is to make sure that the educational needs are met throughout the initiative. I'm going to emphasize it again. And post the initiative to have that ongoing learning until you feel that the this, this status quo has been reached. Nate. Okay, so when we, we talk about the, the how on the training plan, um, it, it really it's really a pretty straightforward uh, way that we, our uh, methodology that we help organizations create these training plans. And it's really first sitting down and saying, what are the end user groups? Uh, again, different different groups are gonna require different training depending on their usage of the new technology, verity and their comfort with technology as a whole. Um, and then it's really sitting down and saying, what are the select um, training methods that are available? Uh, again, we, we find a lot of times, and especially in organizations that haven't completed a technology initiative in the last five years, a lot different now. So but we're, we're all used to 10, 15 years ago where you put a manual in front of someone, they flip through page one, 
page two and they go through and use the system. Now there's a lot more interactive ways of training. There's a lot more um, opportunities to individual specific user. Um, then we sit there and say, what what are the what are the strengths, weaknesses, and gaps with the training methods and the resources in an organization? Do they have a formal training organization? Do they have an education department? Do they have employees in other areas throughout the organization? And is this something we can piggyback on that? Um, and then it's really sitting down and saying, what is the timeline? And how how are we going to work back from go live, post go live, working backwards to say when do we start training? I think it's really important here to talk about the fact that um, we without it, you know, without fail, every one of our clients, we talk about the fact that when we kick off a change management initiative, training, even though it's far down the line as far as a, an implementation is really something that needs to start today. You really need to sit down and say, how are we going to train the people? And you really have to start with that mindset of, how are we going to get people ready to use the technology? If you have the technology, you can have the best technology in place. If people don't know how to use it, if they're not trained efficiently and effectively, you're going to think that we say, hey, right now, let's start from the beginning. And as we're going through this implementation, Let's think about how we're going to get people ready to use it and how we're going to make them comfortable with the system going forward. We're here with Donia and Nate talking about change management deliverables. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. We're here with Donia and Nate, who are presenting a keynote presentation about change management deliverables. Let's jump right back into it. One of our, our LinkedIn audience members said, is change management something that can be dialed into the program at different points? Or is it a big mistake to not integrate it from beginning to end? So maybe um, Nate, we'll start with you on that one. Yeah, this is this is a great question. And this is something um, that really hits home. One of One of our biggest clients here at Third Stage, we kicked off about a year ago. Um, they were about um, around nine months into a technology initiative, the implementation program, um, we were called in, um, you know, where I would say nine months into a 24 month um, initiative. And um, really, I would say it's never too late to start. So um, <clears throat> it, it, it's while it, while it, 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 it's ideal, you know, obviously the, the best case scenario is to start everything at the beginning it's never too late to start and you can always go through and you can make up the steps and you can catch up to where you are um, it, it's it's like a lot of different um, pieces of a digital transformation it's something that's really important that you um, address change that you um, address the the change impacts the change initiative that you're going through never too late to start and um, always you, there's always something that you can gain out of it by doing it, even if it's really late within the, the project. Excellent. And Donia, anything to add to that? Yes, yes. Um, I, I want to bring in here, this is it's really great uh, to bring in this element of a health check. I love this word. <laughs> it's It's something that I've been more recently in my career exposed to i think because of these kind of scenarios that have that like this user has brought up 
you know, where things are not done up front. And I really like this concept of a health check. And as Nate mentioned, we are working with some companies that have actually had this pitfall, pitfalls and not done it up front and realized, okay, we need to start with this or we need to wave, weave it through. So we stop, we pause, we come in, we do a health check against all the uh, categories, all the objectives of change management, look at what are the gaps and what is the corrective action that can be taken. All great stuff. Um, and then uh, we have a few more questions here. Do you guys want to address those now or do you want to finish up with your PowerPoint? We can do it at the end. Carla, we've got one more uh, deliverable to go through. So right. just to connect all five and it might just close off the picture. Uh, do you agree, Nate, that we quickly finish off? Yeah, and, and KPIs are, are fairly quick, uh, fairly yes. straightforward. So let's let's do that and then we'll jump into some questions and I know we're running a little bit behind, so okay. uh, we could go through KPIs real quick. All right, KPIs, as, as Nate said, very quickly, uh, but very important <laughs> and something that comes uh, needs to be looked at right at the beginning. If you remember with that readiness document we spoke about, we look into why is this change taking place. Already from there, you need to ask the question of, what do we want to achieve and how will it be measured? And that needs to be relevant. It needs to be measurable. It needs to be agreed so that come down the line, you hit the, press the button, you add go live, and then you can actually measure both the success of the benefits of the, the change as well as the user adoption and that will allow to take corrective action if something is picked up. Um, I'm going to just move on to the how because I know we've got very little time. <laughs> Again, I could speak about it for, for hours. Go ahead, Nate. Yeah, so basically this this is um, KPIs are really uh, something that we link back to the first deliverable that we start with, and that is really sitting down and talking to the end users and the leadership and saying, what is it that you, um, what are your goals from this new technology initiative? And it's really saying, um, what do you hope to get out of the technology? Um, how are we going to measure what success is? measuring, um, creating a measuring mechanism and um, and really sitting down and starting to say, can we measure how we're doing things today and, um, and get a baseline for where we are today and where we will, and then start to then really track key performance indicators, not only on our current technology, but as we go live and as post, as we go post live, and using the system to, to really sit down and say, how are we benefiting from this technology? This is really one of the most deliverables within a change management initiative. However, I say this is really mm -hmm. probably one that organizations struggle with the most. It's really mm -hmm. hard to define. It's really hard to, um, to measure. It's really hard to track, but organizations is that and clearly create KPIs and and run their business based on the success and on the benefits that they're getting from their technology really see the most benefit from a new technology initiative. Awesome, guys. Well, if, if we can, we're going to take a few extra minutes to um, go over these questions, um, if you're ready for that. Um, so if you if you're done sharing, we, I can put them up here on screen if you if you want to be able to see them. Um, so first of all, I just want to Lindsay has a great question here. Um, so are all the deliverables shown at the beginning or are they in parallel or what does that look mm -hmm. like as far as those? Don't you, you want to take that? Yeah, maybe I could, I was just going to say, maybe I could take that, Nate, and it actually works very well with this final slide that we've got on. So they, they are not a stepping stone. Yes, absolutely. They can be done in parallel. There's some that you would like, obviously, likely want to start up front. You know, some that are clearly up front, for example, the readiness assessment. 
Um, but once it's done, the readiness assessment, it becomes a live document and you need to continue feeding that document as more clarity and more uh, is more clarity, more changes are defined along the way. And then as you sort of like start one, you carry on with it, you start the next one and then you start the next one. So they do end up moving in parallel. And I'm really glad you asked this because our final slide shows suddenly 15 items. And that's because we want to show you that these the um, deliverables that run in parallel are addressing what we consider these 15 objectives. And the most important thing is to reach these objectives. Whether you're going in parallel, you might go a bit like in a circle, but ultimately to make sure you address all the objectives of change management that are listed here. And, and just one thing to add to that, I, I think, you, Danya, you really made a great point, and that is um, <clears throat> there is some linear nature to these deliverables, but it's really um, when we sit down with the client and we're kicking off a change management initiative, we make sure that we spend uh, a good day at the beginning of a project going through all of these deliverables and all of these phases of a change management initiative because they, they do need to work in parallel. They do need to, um, you need to start KPIs. At, at, you need to start thinking about them at the beginning of a project. You need to start thinking about the way you're going to communicate, the way you're going to train your employees. So while it's, you know, it, it probably Probably uh, it always starts off with assessment to really say how ready are we for this change. It, it, it's really important to know that um, all of these need to be addressed from the beginning. So um, you need to start thinking about all five right from the start. Absolutely, definitely something um, to to consider. So this is a really interesting question too, um, and I think it goes into something that Eric said and that Dominic also touched on in his quality assurance and the overall ROI of a digital transformation is that concept of user acceptance. Um, so this question says, do you think it's useful to combine the planning for user acceptance testing and wider training as training for UAT? Um, and kind of saying, can people get familiar with the new process and technology? I'm just taking a moment to really get to the heart of this question. <laughs> I think so too. I think I think it's basically um, user acceptance testing and the wider training. Should those be um, done together, or what does that look like as far as not only the structure, but how do you get them familiar outside of testing um, to with the new process and technology? Yeah. Well, the way I see it is that uh, they probably different things. So the user acceptance testing is usually done with a small group to see, you know, how's this technology go, uh, matching to the requirements. Whereas when we're talking training, we're actually looking at training across the organization, across all the stakeholders, uh, people that are somehow engaging with this change, everybody needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, so I see UAT group as a smaller group, if I understood the question correctly. And um, obviously the people doing the UAT will probably get to have a little bit more interaction with the system up front, but really everybody needs to be considered in the training plan. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's important just to add to that. None of these happen in a bubble. They're they're all part mm -hmm. of system integration, mm -hmm. testing, training, and user acceptance. It needs to happen concurrently. It all needs to happen considering all the other pieces. So you don't just complete user acceptance testing, system integration testing, and training. They're all happening at the same time. Yes, and and I think that that cohesion is so important because sometimes those silos can kind of bubble up in these change management um, processes or plans, mostly because some some teams are really good at change and some teams have a different subculture. So I know there's lots of questions here, and I really appreciate all of the great questions. Um, we're going to do one more um, from YouTube and then let Donia and Nate get back to uh, their client work. Um, but let's read this question. So how do we align the change management and the project management of the actual digital transformation requirements? Is one part of the other? Are they managed by two different teams or are they a se sequential endeavor? 
So let's let's start with you on this one, Donia. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kyla. So the way I see this is that the change management is part of the project management. So a project manager would need to look at so many elements of the um, of the entire project, for example, the development of the actual system, for example, or a piece of customization. And the change management steps would be part of that overall plan. So they, as Nate said, all of these things are integrated. In terms of management by separate teams, part of it, we highly recommend that there are focused change management resources, especially in larger projects. In some cases, if it's a very small uh, company, for example, or a very small change, you, as long as change management is addressed, it can be done by the same project management team. Um, but as I started out saying, project management looks at a lot of different elements and we need the change management expertise to focus. You saw all those different deliverables, how they feed into each other, looking at the different impacts of different groups. So it's very important to have the change management focus working integrated into the full project. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Won't, won't even elaborate on that. That was a great, great answer. <laughs> Just yeah, like the mic drop situation here. Um, great, okay, exactly. <laughs> great, um, great session, you guys. Thank you so much. And I know, um, thank you to all of our great engagement. I know you have a lot of questions. If you'd like to connect with Donia and Nate, I did drop both of their LinkedIn profiles um, in our LinkedIn stream. So in, be sure to follow them for additional thought leadership in, in this area. All right. Thank you, Donia and Nate. Great. Great uh, presentation and uh, certainly our audience at the Stratosphere event enjoyed that session and hopefully the, the podcast listeners here enjoyed that clip as well. Uh, we've got a few things that we're going to debrief on related to that, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event it's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings. And the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. I'm here with Kyler and we just had... Donia and Nate on the show talking about uh, change management deliverables. What were some of your takeaways, Kyler? Yeah, well, this is a you know such an important topic. Um, just most of the time when you talk about change management, it's always not clear what exactly does that mean. And it's also a, a common misperception that it's not a data science or a data-driven approach, which um, obviously Nate and Donia kind of took took you through how you might assess your overall organization and what that organizational change assessment looks like. Um, and then obviously a, a lot of the audience input as well. And so a, a lot of times what we see as far as just the dynamics within our clients is they're not incredibly sure as to what they should receive, especially if, if they're in more of the mid-tier area and don't have a change specific team. So Eric, I, I wanted to kind of look at when you are going through a conversation with a change management 
consultant or vendor, what are some main questions that you should be asking them when it comes to ensuring that you're actually working with someone legitimate that is going to give you actionable and data-driven deliverables? Well, I think the first and foremost is that last, uh, those last few words you said is, is are, are the deliverables actionable? Are they tangible? Is it something that adds value or is it something that just kind of makes people feel good? And you, you, to be fair, you do want to make people feel good when you're going through transformation because there's a lot of stress and fear and uncertainty and doubt, but you also need to add business value or else what too often happens is executives will shut down the change management work stream because it's just, uh, you know, it's not adding value. It's costing money. It's, it's a distraction, all that stuff. And that's the last thing that that's the last way that people should be thinking of change management. So tangible deliverables, actionable deliverables. I'd also look to how integrated are those deliverables into some of the more core activities of a transformation, like process improvement, the technology piece of it. Is it like a standalone siloed change work stream, or is it something that's actually embedded and, and ingrained into the, into the project? Um, and then also, you know, your change management consultants too. I think it's, it's actually really hard for, for me and for us as a company to find good change management consultants, not because there's not enough people out there that have done change management or not enough good pro certified consultants out there because there's plenty of them. The hard part though, is finding people that understand change, but they also understand operations. They understand supply chain, they understand finance and HR. And on one hand, no, you can't be an expert in everything, but I think change management practitioners that understand change, but in my opinion, even more importantly, understand operations and strategy and just how business works. I think you need to have both. Otherwise change management will end up being sort of an ivory tower, standalone siloed sort of a, a thing. And then the final thing I'd say is you also want to make sure you have a change strategy and approach that's tailored. So I think too often change management people have sort of the right answer that every client should follow. And it's just, it's sort of like a toolbox. I mean, I think every change practitioner should have a really robust toolbox, but know when and how to pick and choose what to use within that based on who the company is and what their culture is and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, I think um, one of the problems, again, with change management consulting is that people get too, um, what's the word? Um, they're too purist about how change should be. And this is the way, this is the right answer, but I think you have to be more realistic than that. Yeah, absolutely. It has to match the overall identity of the um, the client and the, the organization, um, most certainly. And and we talked a little bit about in the conversation with Donia and Nate, the importance of when change management deliverables should be rolling out within the project. And I think something we see commonly is that change management can be an afterthought as opposed to an intentional beforehand. And I wonder... Um, from from what I've seen, a lot of times when we do an organizational readiness assessment in our phase zero overall planning, it it actually provides a ton of value to the executive team because they had no idea that that was a, a problem or could be a, an issue within the overall transformation. Is that a way to almost sell change management to your executive team as something that needs to happen prior to any sort of software selection or implementation? Uh, yes. In fact, I'd take it a step further and say that there's no possible way that you're going to have a realistic implementation plan and milestone and duration and, and cost it's not going to be realistic or it's not at the very least, it's not going to, it's not going to be well informed if you haven't done some sort of change assessment, because if you think about two parallel transformations, one is a, you know, let's just say that it's the same company or very similar companies and they're all, you know, they're both trying to accomplish the exact same goals. Um, but one organization has a totally different culture than the other. One organization is going to have uh, bigger changes. It's, it's a more massive change or a more wholesale change to their operations and to their people. Whereas maybe the other scenario is more incremental because maybe they're just more advanced technologically or they've, they're have they on a different, uh, more modern system that they're trying to replace. Those two, even though they might be deploying the exact same technology, they're the same industry. In fact, they could even be the same company minus those nuances that are different. If you don't understand those nuances that are different, you can't realistically know how long the implementation is going to take, how much it's going to cost, and how much risk there is unless you've done that organizational assessment. Because it's usually not the technology that slows down a project. It's usually organizational change and to a slightly lesser degree, 
the operational alignment um, is, an, is another uh, factor. So I think that's the way you get executive attention is, look, this isn't something you just put off until training and say, we don't need to worry about change of management until we get to training because by then it's too late and you don't really understand how big the bread box is, the bread box of change, unless you've done that assessment up front as part of your implementation planning. Yes, absolutely. And I, I, um, I definitely think that utilizing some of our thought leadership and Eric's thought leadership when it comes to explaining change management to your executive team has been a tactic that we've seen extremely successful because we do have a ton of case studies, a ton of data when it comes to the thought leadership tab on our website, or you can search for both the third stage and um, Eric's YouTube channel. As we've mentioned a couple times in this episode, our 2023 digital transformation report has a full change management section. Uh, so being able to at least have that conversation with your executive team and explain that there, you know, really is no way to achieve a successful implementation without some change initiatives is so important. And so I hope you found value in that conversation of us really going into what should your expectation be around the deliverables from a change management consultant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, Hopefully it adds, it added some meat and substance to people's understanding of change management as well, which is why we wanted to, to play that clip. So good. Well, well, thank you to Donia and Nate for a great presentation and we're glad we could replay it for the, the audience here. And uh, thank you, Kyler, for another great episode. Thank you to the audience for the great uh, engagement and questions and feedback throughout the episode and, and the various discussions here. Um, want to invite you to subscribe to the channel or subscribe to the, the podcast, wherever you're listening or watching, be sure to subscribe. Uh, you can also follow us, both Third Stage and myself uh, and Kyler individually on social media. So be sure to look for us there wherever you are. We're, we're pretty active on YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok, Instagram, et cetera. So be sure to check us out there. So in the meantime, I hope you all have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week in our next episode of Transformation Ground Control. But in the meantime, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Take care. <laughs>